And welcome to the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory 2021 XR Symposium. My name is Nick DeMatt, your host for this event. I'm one of many staff members here at APL that are working on various immersive technology efforts. We're thrilled to have you join us and excited to share some of the work we've been doing, as well as some work by the extended XR community. This is our second XR Symposium. When we first started planning this event over a year ago, we envisioned something similar to our 2019 XR Symposium that was held at APL. That event was a mix of presentations and hands-on demonstrations, a format that was well received by our presenters and those in attendance. But like most other events of this type since early last year, we too had to make some adjustments. And so this event is fully virtual. So while we won't be able to have attendees experience our work through hands-on demonstrations or mingle afterwards to talk with the presenters and project team members, you will be able to chat with the presenters during their recorded session. Time permitting, there will also be a brief Q&A period directly following each presentation. This year, we're holding three abbreviated days, all on ZoomGov using Zoom's webinar format. This format will allow us to mimic what a typical face-to-face -face meeting might be like with respect to speaker courtesy and a moderated question and answer period. For example, all attendees will be muted upon joining the event, regardless of when they enter or leave, to ensure that fellow attendees are not disturbed. Also, by holding the event, the event over three shortened days, uh, we hope to avoid any Zoom fatigue that's generally associated with a full day of meetings. And this will also allow our guests to time to attend other normal work activities. As you can see from the day one agenda, we're starting in the late morning. This is so our West Coast attendees can join at a reasonable time. And ending in the afternoon, so our East Coast attendees don't have to stay past their normal work hours. All times listed are Eastern Standard Time. The majority of our presentations have been recorded. This way, the presenters can monitor the Q&A feature to answer any questions and provide additional insight in a timely fashion. So we highly recommend that everyone monitor this feature to obtain this information that the presenter may be posting or to send questions to the event panelist as needed. Throughout the event, we will be posting information about the next presentation and when it will start. This will let everyone know what to expect during any quiet times between presentations. Our intention is to stay true to the posted times that you see on the agenda schedules. Unfortunately, we won't be providing a copy of any presentation, either during the event or at a later time. But you may contact the presenter directly to see about obtaining a copy. The online agenda includes the title of the presentation, the abstract, and the abstract information contains the presenter's contact information. Also different this year is our collaboration with Mr. John Grant and the Virtual Worlds Forum to bring attention to the immersive technology work we are both doing for the DOD and other government agencies. So I just wanna spend a, a minute or so talking a little bit about uh, the Virtual Worlds Forum. Since 2015, uh, John has been coordinating the forum meeting and its related activities. The forum is a group of US government representatives who are researching, developing, testing, assessing, and using the new breed of low cost, high quality immersive applications to enhance the various aspects of the respective mission areas. They meet every three to four months in various locations throughout the United States, or more recently virtually, to collaborate to help reduce the individual organizational burden on common interest. 
The event is also an opportunity for our government, academia, and industry partners to describe, discuss, showcase, demonstrate, and experience various XR capabilities. The meetings usually include a closed classified day when possible and a separate open unclassified day. John will be a presenter on Wednesday and uh, well, he'll be giving a live tour, tour of his Fort Huachuca facility and providing an overview of Thursday's 20th Virtual Worlds Forum event, which will be hosted on Microsoft Teams. The theme for that event is head mounted displays ergonomics, broadly including such topics as safety, comfort, wearability, VR sickness, eye strain, neck strain, fatigue, and usability design. Attendees will learn more about potential limitations and future expectations for long-term use as immersive devices are more widely adopted for daily workflows. You're encouraged to reach out directly to Mr. Grant via his email address to learn how to register for Thursday and to learn more about the forum in general. Uh, note for our APL and government attendees, uh, please note that the presentations have been cleared for public distribution. However, any information of, about a particular project that would be considered CUI will need to be handled offline. You know, we, we continue to see great improvements in the XR world, whether it be with new hardware products, improved software development kits, a broadening number of use cases, or successful deployment of XR applications in the private and public workforce. It seems everywhere we look, XR is getting more attention and serious recognition as a valuable and impactful technology. We hope that the presentations you attend this week will help you better understand the potential of this technology and also stimulate your imagination as you consider how to reinvent or innovate solutions for some of your more challenging mission objectives. So on behalf of my fellow APL team members, I thank you for attending and sincerely hope that you will have a better understanding how this technology can benefit your team and your stakeholders. Our moderator for this event is Dr. Ari Rafkin Blankhorn. Um, at this point in time, we're going to have a short break and Ari will be back to introduce our first presentation at 11.15. Thank you.
everyone, and thanks for joining us today for the APL XR Symposium. I'm Ari Rapkin Blenkorn, and I'll be the moderator for the speaker sessions. And um, as Nick explained in his intro remarks a few minutes ago, most of the sessions have been pre-recorded, so we will be showing the pre-recorded video presentation and following that with a live Q&A session with the speakers. Uh, we ask that if you have questions and comments, please use the Q&A feature of the Zoom interface to provide those. All right, it is my pleasure to introduce our first presentation of the symposium. Nick Kantak is an electrical engineer at APL and his presentation is about a project called Eye on Team, which enables seeing teammates through floors, walls, and obstacles. Away we go. Hello, I'm Nick Kantak, and I'm the principal investigator for Eye on Team, a year and a half effort to develop a system of body-worn sensors that give tactical team members the ability to see each other through floors, walls, and obstacles. Ion Team has secured two internal catalyst grants at APL. Our team has included staff from multiple sectors, with the main contributors shown on this slide. Let's talk about tactical teams. I use the phrase tactical teams to mean any group of individuals collaborating towards a common mission in an environment hostile enough to require the use of strategy and tactics by the team members. This includes soldiers, police, firefighters, EMTs, and many other types of teams. These teams usually enter their environments with specially designed technology. However, despite the vast repertoire of sophisticated technology at these teams' disposal, there is still a simple but glaring problem that all teams face in indoor environments. Teammates are fundamentally blind to each other's locations. What I mean is this. From the moment a tactical team enters an indoor environment, teammates will rapidly and persistently lose visual contact with one another while accomplishing their mission. Because this blindness affects all tactical teams the same, it's difficult to appreciate how extraordinary of a disadvantage it really is. But what if some teams didn't have this extraordinary disadvantage? Ion Team emerged as a project to answer a simple question. What if team members could always see their teammates? In this presentation, I refer to this concept as virtual line of sight. While virtual line of sight might seem like a meager improvement to a tactical team's capabilities, I hope to impress on you the extraordinary tactical advantage that virtual line of sight can convey. But before we discuss that, I'd like to show you exactly what I mean. Here is a video of our system in action. What you see is a recording from the HoloLens on which our application is running. You are seeing exactly what a team member would see when using our system. You'll see me, your teammate, move about in the indoor environment wearing an XR headset. Whether or not you have true line of sight with me, you always have virtual line of sight. Even as I move to different rooms and floors, you can visually confirm my location at all times. Hopefully you are beginning to see some of the significant advantages that this capability can convey. For one, it would be far less likely for us to have an incident of friendly fire, since we would be able to deliberately avoid exchanging fire in each other's directions, and we would be far less likely to be surprised by each other's sudden appearance. Additionally, if I was under distress and needed assistance, you would be able to navigate to my location even if I was non-responsive. Let me emphasize that. Even if I was unable to respond to your calls, you would be able to visually see where I am and able to orchestrate a rescue around that information. These are just a few of the numerous significant advantages we imagine, all stemming from the simple capability of persistent virtual line of sight. I'd like to discuss the system architecture. This graphic illustrates the simplest version of our system. In the left, 
you can see all of the body-worn components that are present on each team member. These components include an XR headset, in our case the HoloLens, and a custom wrist-worn controller of our design. This enables each team member to control their headset and our application's features in a convenient and unobtrusive way, without requiring the user to direct their attention to the controlling interface. Throughout all of our design work, we held fast to the requirement that our system should never distract the user from their environment, even for a moment. Otherwise, we would risk doing more harm than good. Both the XR headset and the wrist controller are connected wirelessly with a network hub. In our case, this was a wireless router broadcasting a Wi-Fi network. We referred to the router as the mothership because it brokered all communication between components within the system. Each XR headset tracks its user's position and regularly sends that position update to the mothership. In return, it receives from the mothership information about the location of all other team members. This scheme provides good scalability and makes it easy to include multiple team members, up to the client limitation of the router itself. I'd like to acknowledge that in this architecture, the mothership stands out as a clear weakness. Disabling the mothership kills all communication between team members. However, this is one of several possible architectures. We also explored options for a mesh network configuration. In this configuration, the mothership is removed and team member technology communicates directly with the technology on nearby teammates. Lots of research exists for efficient mesh networks, but in the interest of pursuing the tactical advantage of our technology as far as possible, we opted to stay away from a mesh network approach and implement the simpler mothership architecture to facilitate faster prototyping. The software architecture is also relatively simple. Our main software application which runs on the HoloLens is developed using the Unity 3D game engine. Unity was a powerful choice for our development since it facilitates platform agnostic development. This means it was easier for us to develop our software to be able to run on a variety of devices. As you will see later, this allowed us to develop a PC-based version of the application from which we could prototype and test features before deploying them to the HoloLens, and this led to faster design iterations. The Mothership server software was custom-built using Node.js. I'd like to now step back in time and quickly outline the technical work that supports the system's performance. The Ion Team project originally emerged as an effort to perform indoor localization using radios to measure all of the distances between pairs of teammates. If you can accurately measure distances between nodes in space, there is a well-studied algorithm that can extract the 3D map of nodes in space. Recall, I said this was possible if you can measure node-to-node -node distances accurately, and that is very difficult to do indoors. One of the primary reasons is what's called multipath or when there are multiple paths for the signal to travel from transmitter to receiver. Just as an announcer's voice becomes muddled by echoes off surfaces in a stadium, radio signals reflect off walls and produce echoes that interfere with the original signal. Thus, the received signal is a complicated combination of the direct signal as well as many different echoes. In the upper right, there are two figures showing the field intensity of a broadcast signal in outdoor and indoor scenarios. Note the chaotic and complicated structure of the indoor signal strength. Literature has many ideas of ways to attempt to compensate for the influence of multipath, but Ion Team focused on identifying novel and creative ways to overcome multipath that were specific to the tactical team environment. One example of this was an algorithm we developed called BreakFormation. BreakFormation is an augmented version of a well-known algorithm for node mapping known as Classical Multidimensional Scaling, or CMDS. Break formation uses unique boundary conditions to compensate for multipath and signal attenuation effects, and it also applies a machine learning method for optimizing the initial solution. One boundary condition is that we are able to measure the motion of each teammate, for example through pedometry, SLAM, or other means, which can be used to vet the time evolution of the map solution. Another boundary condition is that tactical teams can often begin their mission in a group, a huddle for instance which helps the localization algorithm calibrate during times that wall influences are known to be inconsequential. In short, Ion Team's first breakthroughs came in the form of ways to fuse diverse sensor streams with a unique set of boundary conditions 
to achieve indoor localization accuracy that is not possible with more general localization techniques. We did encounter some challenges along the way, and I'd like to highlight one of the bigger hurdles. There's a lot on this slide, but I'm going to break it down carefully. Earlier, I mentioned fusing sensor streams to get better position estimations. Let's focus on fusing pedometry with RF ranging. What I mean is that I have two simultaneous ways of estimating my position. One method is by measuring my motion and estimating what change that motion induces on my location. Another is by measuring my distance to other nodes using RF signals. These two techniques have very different strengths and weaknesses. Pedometry tends to make very small errors, but they stack up over time. If I only use pedometry, I'll have a good estimation at first, but my accuracy will decay over time. RF ranging does not have error that stacks up in time, but it has lots of noise in the short term. Thus, RF ranging is a very coarse estimation, but unlike pedometry, it doesn't get worse with time. The equation at the top of the slide shows one way of fusing these pieces of information into a single position estimation. And this equation allows us to quantify the impact that errors in each sensor stream have on the overall position error. I use alpha as a tunable factor that allows me to give preference to one method over the other. The idea is that there is an optimal alpha value that gives me the optimal mix of the two position estimates. Optimal in this case means imparting the smallest estimation error. Provided the errors are sufficiently close, you can find an optimal alpha as shown in the figure in the upper right. However, if the errors in the sensor streams are too different, you might find an optimal alpha equal to zero, which indicates one estimation method is so superior to the other that you gain nothing by including the inferior method. We found ourselves in this very situation. During our initial phases, we had pedometry and RF errors that were roughly equivalent, so an optimal alpha could be found that gave us a mix of the two methods. However, when we transitioned from our initial Android platform to the HoloLens, our pedometry error decreased profoundly. This is because we transitioned from using a fairly simplistic accelerometer-based pedometry algorithm to simultaneous localization and mapping, or SLAM. The HoloLens is equipped with cameras and LiDAR, which allows its SLAM to be much more accurate than our original pedometry algorithm. Consequently, our SLAM errors were so much smaller than our RF errors that our optimal alpha indicated we should abandon RF estimation in full favor of the SLAM solution. However, if we abandon the RF ranging solution, we recover the drift problem from which all pedometry methods, including SLAM, suffer. Therefore, we were in need of a means to correct for tracking errors that accumulate with, from the HoloLens's SLAM over time. To find a solution, we return to our strategy of exploiting unique boundary conditions that are specific to tactical team scenarios. We found that by tracking the motion of teammates over time, we could identify signatures in the data that correspond to indoor landmarks. These landmarks were unifying points that were present across all team member tracks. As a result, these landmarks could be used as alignment points, and each team member could track could be used in a collective and collaborative mapping process. If a tracking error accumulates for one team member, we can correct the error when they approach a landmark. For instance, when many team members use a stairway, the system gets a good fix for the location of that stairway. If another team member ascends the stairs while carrying a six-foot tracking error, the system will initially indicate that they are climbing thin air six feet to the right of a staircase. In this scenario, the system can immediately detect a six-foot tracking error and apply a shift to correct the erroneous team member's tracking. In this way, team members can collaboratively vet each other's tracking over time. Detecting these landmarks and correcting tracking error was no simple task, and we had to do a lot of work just to make it practical. This included developing a model that worked with proxy statistics that were faster to calculate than traditional statistical measures. However, this approach ultimately led to a highly accurate model that could very consistently detect stairways and implement tracking error correction. Before concluding, I'd like to illustrate some of the other features we've developed and tested, which scratch the surface of what this technology could enable. Throughout this list of features, you'll see a recurring theme of exploring ways that AR could replace or augment verbal communication. 
We attempted to explore in depth how this technology opens new modes of nonverbal communication that can provide novel strategic advantages for tactical teams. This slide demonstrates our application deployed to a PC test environment, complete with AI opponents to help test out the tactical advantage of each feature. The PC environment allowed us to orchestrate team scaled tests of the features in an adversarial environment without needing to reserve large indoor spaces. Additionally, this method allows testers to assemble virtually into tactical teams and execute tests without the need to congregate, a major advantage during COVID-related precautions. Another feature we explored is the ability of the system to track position history, thereby discovering paths within the unknown 3D environment. These paths can be shown as a trail of holographic breadcrumbs. As a tactical team navigates their environment, they map out paths within the environment and create a network of routes that can be used in different applications. For instance, the system can automatically highlight a path from one teammate to another, as would be helpful in the case of a rescue. Additionally, efficient evacuation routes can be highlighted when needed. Finally, we've explored ways that autonomous platforms such as UGVs and small UAVs can use this path information to collaborate with their human team members to accomplish tactical objectives. In this video, we illustrate how a team member can signal the need for assistance without any verbal communication. When the teammate indicator turns gray, I'm alerted that my team member has requested assistance. The system also uses its collective path information to highlight the fastest path I can take to reach my team member. I'm also able to see my teammates' path history, so I can choose to retrace their steps or to find a different path to their location if I want to avoid any hazards they may have encountered on their path. This allows me to navigate to my team member much faster than if we only had audio communication. And this feature would also be critical if my team member was unable to respond to my audio communication. We've also implemented a feature that allows team members to drop 3D markers in space to alert their teammates of the location of threats. In this example, a team member marks the location of a recently spotted enemy. An arrow in the display corner guides the team to the location of the threat and allows the entire team to coordinate to defeat the marked threat. In this way, team members can contribute to a global situational awareness that is rapidly and efficiently distributed across the team. Finding out how to drop a 3D marker in space was not a trivial feat, but we eventually found a method that worked well across floors and long distances. This slide demonstrates the enemy marking process. With their hand on the controller and eyes on the threat, the user can, with two button presses, mark the bottom and top of the enemy threat. In this way, our system can accurately calculate the 3D position of the threat and place a marker in the hologram space so that all team members can be notified of the 3D location of the threat. In the video on the right, the feature is demonstrated in AR. The last feature I will show today is a proof of concept of integrating path information with machine counterparts. In this video, the mothership remotely pilots a UAV in the indoor environment using path information that was generated by human members of the team. Additionally, team members are able to see their machine counterparts in AR, giving virtual line of sight in the exact same way that team members can always see each other's locations. We've only scratched the surface of ways that this technology could enable human machine teaming concepts but we believe that we have been able to demonstrate enormous promise in this area. To conclude, Ion Team is a system allowing team members to see each other through floors, walls, and obstacles. Beyond this, Ion Team explores the ways that augmented reality can open up a new, fast, and efficient visual means of communication between tactical teams with the potential to transform how teams collaborate in indoor environments. I believe the day is fast approaching when tactical teams wouldn't dare to enter an adversarial environment without these capabilities. And I'm very excited to discuss what steps we can take to reach that goal in the near term. If you have ideas about how to extend the impact of this technology, or have more questions about the work we did, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you. All right, I hope that the ION team presentation video has got everybody awake and excited about this topic. 
Um, now we're going to move to the live Q&A session. We have about uh, eight minutes for you to submit your questions. And I see a few coming in through the Q&A interface already. Uh, I'll just remind you the Q&A controls are at the bottom of the Zoom window and type them in and let's hear from Nick. Um, there we go, Nick unmuted. Yep, I'm all ready to go here. Um, thanks okay. everyone for attending. Uh, we'll just get started with the questions here. So Erica's already uh, asked a question. Um, if this could be used in, in context, perhaps outside of tactical teams. Um, the suggestion is like tunnels and underground, or perhaps operating in a mine. Um, yes, conceivably it could be. Uh, and I think that there's there's a lot of potential for this technology beyond just the, the context that we considered. Um, so I think, you know, in, in the event of like a tunnel collapse, um, being able to show like routes or, or when their visibility is, is reduced, which are some situations that we considered, um, if, if this technology can be used to kind of give you the information you need to navigate your environment. And I think that is the case long term. The one thing I want to qualify that with is that um, even like the, the mine example here, um, we were definitely pushing the limits of what the technology could do, in particular the hollow lens that we were working with. So for example, the SLAM uh, tracking of motion over time typically needed fairly nice conditions in order to work very well, which is a, a serious limitation of the technology. So you're not always gonna have a well-lit environment uh, for your SLAM to operate. In the case of like a, a mine collapse, um, that's gonna be particularly challenging. Um, so there's, there's a lot that the technology could do to improve, to be more robust in these types of situations. But um, I think that what this project shows is that, that there's potential and provided that we can push the limits on what the technology can do, there's p potentially high impact applications that we can, we can uh, apply this technology to. The ability to work underwater is something that somebody's suggesting. I don't know about that. Um, I, I really don't know. That would be quite quite interesting. I, in terms of like the the Hololens's lidar concept, I, in principle, I would think it could work still in optical, uh, but that that's definitely out of my area of expertise. But but I'm very interested in the, the idea of, of expanding this to underwater environments. Um, so Vaughn's asking, are we working with local coordinate systems or do we uh, do any work to join this to a global coordinate system? So we do join it into a global coordinate system. Uh, that's work that's, that's done um, at the mothership level. In fact, the way that we had uh, worked our system is that we, we initialize all members of the team in the same coordinate system. So what that means is that each team member starts in the same location. So we have like a spawn point, so to speak. It's actually like a physical point in space that we've marked off where the user stands. They have to face in a certain direction so they get their orientation calibrated as well. And then when the application boots up, it knows that's in that calibrated orientation and position. And then from then on, we rely on the accuracy of our algorithms to avoid tracking error over time. But that's how we can sort of work in, in a unified coordinate system because all initialized coordinate systems for the team members are approximately the same. And then we rely on the mothership's um, tracking correction to, to deal with any issues or any errors that were present in the, in the tracking uh, calibration. Um, work with telemedicine, um, monitoring surgical procedures and guiding the process. Yes, I've, this would be a good idea. And I've actually seen this um, when I was at the Futureport Prague um, uh, symposium that they were having uh, two years ago. It was before all the COVID stuff. But they had a, a station set up where they were working with the HoloLens and it was actually like a training situation. So they had like a real dummy uh, that they were practicing surgery on. But when you wore the HoloLens, you saw this augmented view where it was showing you instructions of what you needed to do, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I think you could certainly expand that to, you know, having like a specialist guide someone else. So I think there's a lot of interesting concepts there. Perhaps you could have, you know, doctors who are working in, in very remote areas, they could have you know, a specialist from afar that's sort of looking over their shoulder during a procedure that they otherwise might not be a uh, you know, world-class expert on and still get world-class medicine that's administered remotely. So I think there's a lot of really interesting concepts there. Range limitations on the mothership. Um, Absolutely. That's a, that's a very serious concern. I'm glad you bring that up. Yeah. So especially when you're working in indoor environments, it's not easy for a central station to have wireless communication 
um, with things that are really far away, especially if you're operating in like a large environment or, or if it's an outdoor environment and you're simply working with large scale ranges. Um, that's true. So one way to, uh, to address that, um, you could you know, work with a mesh network configuration. So then you could, you could rely on teammate to teammate communication, but that kind of requires a certain critical density of team members. So you can't have one person going off far away from the group. Otherwise you're gonna to start to, to lose connectivity with them. So I think that, that that's definitely like a, a challenge. We didn't really get into that too much. Um, we were focusing more on what would be the user experience and kind of assuming that there were ways to deal with that down the road. Um, but that's a, that's a very legitimate challenge. And, and I think it's something that, that would stand in the way of operationalizing this, or you would at least need a very good solution for that. And I'm not sure what the best solution for that would be. Um, any type of solid state gyroscopic technology to maintain locational awareness to the mothership. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> I know there's, there's uh, gyroscopic sensors within the HoloLens. Uh, I'm pretty sure that at least they were in the augment in the, the Android platform that we were using. We were leveraging the gyroscopes within the Android um, to, to track orientation as well as correct for, for changes over time. Um, I'm not familiar if like solid state gyroscopic technology is something unique or different than that and, and advantageous. Um, but if you have more questions about that, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear more about those offline. Um, have I tried to map the initial point to a geospatial coordinate system? Ah, so if it was working with like GPS, I have not tried that. Um, I would, I think conceivably we could do that provided that we knew the GPS location of the calibration point. Um, and provided that we picked the calibration direction to be something we knew, like due north, for example. Um, if we did that, I think we would be able to link up uh, GPS in the sense that we would be able to estimate from our, our, our Cartesian coordinate system relative to the calibration point where we think we are. If we knew the GPS location of the, the calibration point, then we would be able to estimate a GPS location. So it would be interesting then in that case, if you had a good GPS system that you could pull the position of the user from GPS as an additional sensor stream. So then you could use your GPS position to vet the tracking. Um, I think that would be very interesting. One of the reasons that we didn't focus a lot on GPS is just that uh, GPS in indoor environments is pretty tricky. Um, it would have been difficult for us to even get our hands on hardware that was going to be able to to overcome the challenges that that come with indoor GPS tracking just from a, a signal strength standpoint. And so we sort of said, well, let's. And the other thing is that this this uh, uh, project was also envisioned as a possible like way to do positioning in a GPS GPS denied environment. So one of our reasons of not looking into GPS was to say, if we don't leverage GPS, can we still get good tracking? Can we still get these features to work? so that when we're down the road and we're potentially working with GPS denied environments, is this technology and a capability that we'll be able to bring in those environments? I think the results were that we found that we didn't need to leverage GPS in order to do that. But I think you raise a good point that for all the environments that you can leverage GPS, um, you, would, you would likely wanna do that. And I think that that, that would have a role in our, in our fusion model and, and I could see GPS being uh, a useful component. All right, that's uh, the end of the questions that have come in and perfect timing, Nick. Thanks for getting this off to a precise start. No uh, problem. All right, our next talk is from Griffin Millsap, who is also from APL. And Griffin will be talking about brain computer interface in mixed reality. So let's go to the video. Hello, my name is Griffin Millsap and I'm part of the Red Neuroscience Group in the Intelligence Systems Center. I'd like to discuss how mixed reality can transform and truly revolutionize the state of the art in non-invasive BCI paradigms and discuss the hardware and software that I've been working on throughout the last year to integrate a BCI with the Microsoft HoloLens platform. You, uh, you may have heard a little bit about brain computer interface technology as it actually has been in the media quite a bit recently. In case you haven't heard of this technology before, the basic idea is to record neural signals from a user and use signal processing machine learning to translate those neural recordings into control signals that other systems can use to control the cursor on a computer, input text in a word processor, or manipulate robotic prosthetic limbs, or really, you know, whatever you want. 
You may have seen Neuralink's most recent demonstration of simultaneous recording from an unprecedented number of neurons in a pig. Or uh, maybe you've seen a similar recording technology used by our uh, fellow APL colleagues to allow a man to uh, control two prosthetic limbs simultaneously. These are groundbreaking demonstrations that hold a lot of promise for the future of man-machine fusion. These demonstrations speak to the promise of human-machine fusion as explored in sci-fi movies like The Matrix and Ghost in the Shell, although it's pretty unlikely that we'll see neural integration with that degree of sophistication in my lifetime. Uh, let's see, the technology demonstrations on the previous slide are only possible with implanted neural recording devices. If you, as a BCI user, aren't interested in having surgery to use a neural interface, we need to use a slightly different neural recording modality. Taking a step back from invasive and implanted neural interfaces, there's a few, <laughs> there's, there's very few neural recording technologies as well explored and established as scalp electroencephalography, also known as EEG. The core technology goes back to the 1920s and was used for BCI demonstrations as far back as the 80s. EEG is typically used for clinical purposes and requires a technician to help the user, subject, patient, whatever you want to say, uh, apply the electrodes. Um, these traditional wet EEG systems require injection of electrolytic gel to bridge the gap between the electrode and the scalp and provide a low impedance conductive bridge for recording. The market would be very unlikely to tolerate wet EEG technology in consumer BCI applications. So there has been a lot of research and development on dry EEG systems that can record usable electrophysiology without conductive gel. The Cognionics dry EEG system pictured at the right is a world-class wireless dry EEG system with little golf cleat type electrodes that flex and kind of comb through the hair. Although the signal integrity is slightly degraded from what can be recorded using a wet EEG system, the easy to don and doff form factor makes this dry EEG technology an optimal target for uh, scalp EEG based BCI. Um, and, and actually BCI using scalp EEG has a pretty rich history as well. With access to neural recordings, you might think that you can create a classifier for any particular thought or a discriminator for emotional states or you know, things like cognitive workload. This is something we might call a cognitive BCI. And uh, unfortunately, this is where the uh, promise for the technology has really fallen flat. Higher level cognitive BCI is in fact not limited by uh, our recording fidelity. Um, you know, even using the highest quality invasive recordings, we, we, we truly lack a fundamental understanding of how these cognitive phenomena are represented in the electrophysiology, which makes it difficult to build a classifier for. <laughs> In reality, our most usable and consistent BCI paradigms are built off of a few consistent neural phenomena relating to primary uh, cortices that handle sensory motor input and output. BCI built on scalp EEG really boils down to a few electrophysiological parlor tricks that we can uh, classify using traditional signal processing algorithms. On the left is an example of you know, probably the strongest, most consistent neural phenomenon in scalp EEG an increased amplitude of 10 hertz oscillations at the rear of the head during periods of relaxation or when the subject closes their eyes. Regardless of what neural mechanisms cause this signal, it's not hard to build a BCI using it. Uh, you can imagine you know, a running estimate of the power spectral density and then a threshold on the 10 hertz power band uh, giving you a pretty good relaxation detector. We refer to this type of neural signal as endogenous because a user can elicit it at any time by simply willing it to be. On the other hand, we have many examples of neural phenomena that are driven by external stimulation. These exogenous neural signals are driven by an external source, such as a strobe light or a sound. They can be augmented by the subject and uh, classified for control of a device. Take, for example, the case where a subject is looking at a strobe light. Each time the light turns on, photons bombard their retina, causing neurons in their eye to fire. There's a very well understood neural circuit between the retina and the primary visual cortex, kind of near the, the back of your head. And uh, generally speaking, each time a retinal cell fires in your eye, there will be a corresponding collection of cells in occipital cortex that fire at the same time. It stands to reason then that if you strobe the light at 10 hertz, a 10 hertz electrophysiological signal can be measured from the scalp at the rear of the head. Although this doesn't seem immediately useful, it turns out that if you present multiple simultaneous strobe lights to the subject, all kind of strobing at different frequencies, the neural signal uh, that we record at the back of the head oscillates at the frequency of only the light that they are paying attention to at that time. 
This is the basis for the steady state visually evoked potential or the SSVEP uh, BCI paradigm, where selections can be made by focusing attention on one of any number of strobing stimuli. So um, most depictions of neural interfaces in science fiction seem to be uh, augmentative or adding more capability to a healthy user. It turns out that BCI based on Scalp EEG tends to land more in the restorative domain. Uh, if we're using an SSVEP BCI to select one of three menu options, for example, a uh, healthy BCI user can just as easily press a button on a keyboard or, or click a mouse button uh, rather than stare at a strobe light for two to four seconds, which is generally how long it, it takes for the uh, electrophysiological signal to be strong enough to classify. Even the fastest and highest quality neural interfaces that have been created using invasive recordings barely muster 20 to 30 characters per minute. This sort of capability is unlikely to be useful to a healthy user, and it has actually been an ongoing challenge to demonstrate a killer app for today's BCI technology in the mass market. All of this said, though, there are a class of severely disabled and uh, well, locked in users who rely on BCI technology for communication. Uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's uh, disease, is an incurable neurodegenerative disease that takes away um, all volitional motor control from a person. They actually, uh, they end up locked in a fully functioning mind trapped in a body that they no longer can exert control over. At some point, they, uh, they even lose their, the ability to blink their eyes, which is kind of like the last binary communication measure that they have. And that's where even a slow and difficult to use neural interface can provide value, uh, a communication interface of last resort. There are very few commercial options for these, uh, for these people, but the setup shown here is a typical BCI setup involving a laptop for stimulus display, a laboratory quality EEG amplifier, which can cost upwards of tens of thousands of dollars, and a wet EEG head cap that requires a specially trained caretaker to apply and set up. Even if we struggle to make a BCI useful to an able-bodied user, there are plenty of improvements we can make to this restorative application use case. Augmented reality, uh, head-mounted devices, and wearable computers could actually revolutionize this type of deployment, though. Instead of carrying around heavy display equipment, we could use augmented reality to provide strobing stimuli that disappear and don't occlude the user's visual stream between uses. Being a, uh, a head-mounted device, we can also co-locate uh, recording sensors, and being a wearable computer, we can even perform all signal processing on board, providing an all-in-one endogenous and exogenous BCI platform in a single head-mounted device. Co-location of high-quality dry EEG sensors with a miniaturized EEG acquisition device could, uh, could make the headset easy to don and doff, and uh, may even provide some utility to able-bodied AR users, allowing for simple menuing where your hands may otherwise be occupied. Stimuli uh, could be placed in spatially relevant locations, such as over light switches or ceiling fans. Object recognition and segmentation using onboard computer vision algorithms could highlight interactable objects in a wearer's environment, and Actions could be chosen using a neural interface instead of, you know, lifting your hand to poke a virtual button or make a gesture. This, this vision really motivated the creation of an augmented reality BCI platform, and uh, this was my passion project for the majority of lockdown this year. So um, I'm, I'm actually wearing the device now. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the construction of it. Uh, I chose to use the OpenBCI Cyton platform as the biosignal amplifier for the project. Texas Instruments saw a market opportunity for high-quality biosignal amplifier ASICs, and they sell these remarkable ADS-1299 chips for about $50 a piece. The OpenBCI group, which is a collection of open source and biosignal enthusiasts, decided to simplify the freely available ADS-1299 evaluation, evaluation board design files while adding a slew of useful features and an Arduino-compatible PIC32 microprocessor. This platform gave me the freedom to attach my own front end and electrodes, as well as write my own firmware for the onboard microprocessor, and I could even write firmware for the radio coprocessor. The uh, specifications on the ADS-1299 allowed me to use higher impedance dry EEG recording electrodes that were, uh, we, we actually uh, had for a Cognionics headset. You can just pop them right off and they have a little snap connector on the back and you know, we can reuse those, those uh, nice dry electrodes. Uh, 
my V0 prototype was simply the uh, OpenVCI Cyton with two Cagnionix electrodes uh, duct taped to a HoloLens 1. I was unsure if the HoloLens visual display had a vibrant enough display and precise enough timing to present a strobing stimulus that would evoke a detectable neural response. After this successful smoke test, though, I began to iterate the rear attachment design. It was around this time that the pandemic lockdown began, and I found myself with really nothing but time to iterate the design and make successively better attachments. I learned how to design my own parts using a CAD program called Shaper 3D on the iPad, and I used Kura and my personal 3D printer, uh, which is a printer bot, uh, to draw, print, and prototype the attachment devices. At one point with version three, I even experimented with actively driven shielding using conductive filament to print shielded enclosures for the electrodes. I also learned how to use Unity during this period, and I built a mixed reality visual display with GUI elements that let me parameterize the strobing stimuli. A big part of this project, though, was to keep the attachment simple to use and not require any external compute resources. The RF Duino is the wireless module for the OpenVCI Cyton, and it advertised it was Bluetooth low energy compliant, so I decided to use Bluetooth to connect to the HoloLens. I quickly ran into issues. It turned out that the default radio firmware for the board used a proprietary extension on Bluetooth low energy called Gazelle Protocol, and an accompanying RF Duino on a USB serial dongle was currently being used to receive raw sample data and send it to any USB capable device, you know, such as a laptop. Basically, it's not standards compliant uh, Bluetooth low energy by default. I couldn't plug a USB device into the HoloLens and I didn't want to because that would be an ugly integration, so I decided to customize the firmware for both the PIC32 and the radio coprocessor to provide Bluetooth communications. Unfortunately, uh, the PIC32 microprocessor, which aggregates and acquires sample data from the ADS-1299, can only communicate with the RF Duino radio coprocessor using a serial communication bus. When running with Gazelle protocol, the serial link was sufficient speed to transfer all of the raw data, but when the radio module was operating in Bluetooth low energy mode, the serial link to the radio coprocessor was limited to 9600 bits per second, which was way less than I needed to transmit the raw data. The solution? The PIC32 coprocessor on the OpenVCI Cyton has uh, 32 kilobytes of memory for program, stack, and heap, and it actually runs at several megahertz. Uh, you know, for clock speed. You know, I think the, the idea was to do all of the BCI processing on the PIC32 microprocessor and then just transmit processing results to the HoloLens. I, uh, I also wrote a Bluetooth low energy implementation using the Universal Windows Platform API to uh, set up a GAT compliant connection between the RF Duino and the Unity app that was uh, running on the HoloLens. I implemented several state-of-the-art biosignal conditioning, filtering, and statistical inference functions into the PIC32 firmware using the C programming language. For SSVEP classification, I use a canonical components analysis to project multi-channel EEG signals and a harmonic progression of sine and cosine functions into the same canonical space with maximized correlation for um, each frequency of interest. This method is favored in the literature over FFT spectral estimation techniques due to its robustness to noise and movement artifacts. I did some deeper reading and found out that the fundamental canonical co components analysis uh, or canonical correlation analysis step uh, can actually be implemented as a singular value decomposition of the matrix multiplication between the, uh, the two matrices that I talked about earlier, the, the multi-channel EEG data and the, uh, the, the harmonic progression of sine and cosine waves. Um, so I actually found a low resource implementation of the singular value decomposition algorithm devised by, of all people, uh, John Nash. I don't know if you've seen the, the movie, It's a Beautiful Mind. Um, but, but yeah, really, really cool that, um, that that kind of popped up and, and it worked. I just, you know, copy pasted the code in, into, into Arduino and, and you know, we're, we're, we're set. The classification algorithm can be run at any time on a rolling circular buffer of pre-processed EEG data corresponding to the last two seconds of acquisition. So the Unity app can send a command over Bluetooth low energy that triggers this computation whenever a strobing stimulus is finished strobing. So you can imagine in Unity, you, you strobe the stimulus for a little bit, you send the command to evaluate um, you know, which SSVEP frequency was present, and then you get a response back from the, uh, from the board. I decided to use um, alpha waves, uh, as, as we discussed earlier, 
to look for a relaxation signal as well that we could use to potentially trigger the SSVEP strobing period, kind of in doing so creating an endogenously triggered exogenous BCI, which is something I haven't seen done before. Um, I decided to use a state-of-the-art alpha detection algorithm from a recent paper implementing a dynamic autoregressive estimation of the filtered alpha signal. I send these alpha values over Bluetooth uh, serial bus at 10 hertz to the Unity app, and uh, that allows the app to decide when to trigger the SSVEP strobing period and the subsequent calculation. So this was actually the first demonstration of the full working system uh, using a spatially anchored stimulus presentation. Um, in the video, I'm actually calling my shots, but I kind of turned off the audio so that I'm not talking over myself. I first focus on C and then A and then B, and there's a little highlighted circle around C right now indicating that it was successfully chosen. This kind of gives you an idea of the speed at which the, uh, the platform works. Um, this particular layout actually uh, was suboptimal for the strobing stimuli because the A circle, which was you know kind of further away from me at the time, uh, was smaller in the display and it was sending less photons and actually evoking a less strong neural signal. In later implementations, I ended up deciding on a head-centric stimulus presentation where the stimuli are kind of always flashing in the periphery of the user's vision no matter what direction their head is, is facing. And you'll see that later in the, in the, in the, in the presentation. Um, so it was around this time that the HoloLens 2 became available to us, and it was a much more comfortable device with eye tracking and other useful sensors that we could take advantage of. Unfortunately, it also has a head footprint that prevents us from acquiring signal at the occipital pole, which is really where we'd like to record for an SSVEP BCI. I adjusted my 3D attachment to fit the HoloLens 2 and ported the Unity app to the new platform hoping that you know, we had a strong enough signal um, on the edges of the footprint to, to be able to detect an SSVEP. With this new fit, it actually uh, became pretty critical to know which electrodes had good contact with the scalp and which needed to be reseated. There's a common method of impedance monitoring in EEG where a small current is injected at a particular frequency and the signal amplitude that is measured at the electrode corresponds to the impedance of the connection between the, the current sink, which is the bias electrode in this diagram, and the electrode. The greater the presence of the impedance tone at the recording site, the higher the impedance, the worse the electrode connection is to the scalp. Most commercial EEG devices have an impedance mode where they just report impedances for a little bit and then like they turn off the impedance tone and then you've just got your, your signals coming through. But I wanted this information continuously during acquisition of EEG signals. I modified the firmware on the device to put the impedance tone at 62 and a half hertz, which is the only frequency in the, that the ADS-1299 could generate with my acquisition settings that wasn't in the EEG frequency band of interest. I implemented a quadrature demodulation strategy to demodulate the impedance tone to baseband for each electrode and characterize its amplitude which uh, was then followed up with a very specifically designed filter to remove the impedance tone before downstream processing on the PIC32. Finally, I decided that uh, I really do need to see the raw data to debug signal integrity issues. So to do this, I couldn't use Bluetooth, but the OpenBCI has an exposed wired serial bus, and I decided to use a Raspberry Pi 0W, the wireless version, to acquire raw sample data from the OpenBCI board and make it available to clients over Wi-Fi. I decided to acquire the data using a Python script that also uses Flask and Socket IO to host a static web server with WebSocket access to the raw data. The Pi Zero has an exposed HTTP server on the local network and any browser enabled device can navigate to this HTTP server and receive a static web page that connects to the WebSocket receives the raw data and actually renders it using a browser-based visualization framework called D3. My PIC32 only has four milliseconds uh, to perform processing and data telemetry uh, because I'm clocking the ADS-1299 at 250 samples per second and after a period of four milliseconds, I need to acquire the next sample. At 9600 baud though, it takes almost a full millisecond to write eight bits of data and it was absolutely imperative that I'm able to transmit one byte per sample over Bluetooth, and 24 bytes per sample for the raw data over the serial port. Um, those were hard requirements. So uh, when combined with all the signal processing and conditioning that I'm doing on, this, on the, the real-time data as well, I was at the limit of what I could accomplish in a four millisecond period. So 
I had to actually boost that serial bus to operate at 230 or 23400 uh, bits per second to uh, accommodate the raw data transmission. And I'm actually going to kind of show what this uh, looks like. I am wearing the device. I'm not just wearing it to be a goofball. I, I do have uh, it, it's on and actually acquiring data. And I have the server running on the Pi Zero. This is the uh, live data, which is being rendered in, uh, in D3. And I'm going to change the offset here just so that we're rendering a little bit better. So um, I'll blink, blink my eyes a few times. This is a little laggy right now because my Wi-Fi connection is a little spotty, but blinking my eyes, there was an eye blink there. And now I'm going to uh, close my eyes for a second, see if we can get some alpha. It's debatable whether that's there or not. Um, sometimes a little bit of signal prep. Uh, if I get my, my, my scalp a little wet, it can kind of help uh, the dry electrodes. But, but yeah, this is the, the raw data coming off the device. If I you know, tap the device a few times, you can see that reacting in real time. And importantly, we're also able to transmit over Bluetooth to the Unity app at the same time that we have this debug stream. So I can actually pull up this browser in the HoloLens browser app if I want and have this display on an augmented reality pane in my, in my um, augmented reality scene, which is actually really, really cool. Um, heading back to the uh, presentation for just a moment. Oh, okay, I guess we got to zip ahead. Let's see here. Cool. All right, so uh, yeah, that works. It's neat. Um, and this, this was the final um, end of year demonstration for um, the strategic IRAD that this was developed um, under where the idea was to use an augmented reality BCI interface to issue neural commands to a robotic partner to achieve a goal, some sort of uh, human machine teaming, in this case, to play Jenga. In the video, I'm making neural commands to poke and then pick and place blocks in a Jenga tower that correspond with color-coded SSVEP targets in my periphery. The holographic block overlay is accomplished using a Vuforia co-registration marker kind of seen at the uh, at the bottom of this video here. And, uh, and, and yeah, I'll just give this a play through here quick. Um, the red block in the middle corresponds to the B target, which is at the top center here. The A is kind of green, and like this little green block here is, um, corresponds to that A target, and then there's this blue C block here. They're all in one row. Um, and it actually looks a little bit better in the headset, but when you just render the blocks on top of the tower, it's a little hard to see where, they, where they're supposed to be. But there I did a B selection and saw that the tower didn't move when I poked it. So um, the system was programmed so that when I select B again, it will automatically know to pick and place that, that particular block, which is what's happening here. I selected B again, and now the robotic manipulation system is placing that. Um, Mad props to new um, new section uh, member, uh, Preston Peranik, uh, in our group, in our neuroscience group, for putting together the Unity portion of this demonstration, and also to Andrew Badger for working some Ross magic to connect all of our uh, systems here. Also, Dave Handelman uh, did the amazing robotic manipulation uh, command software and built the manipulation platform uh, using some commercial off-the-shelf robotic uh, limbs. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's the real MVP of this demo. It's, it's working perfectly. Like it, this, this thing barely ever failed. It always was able to pick and place the blocks. Really, really cool. Um, but yeah. So in summary, I used Quarantine to create an all-in-one DIY friendly and inexpensive augmented reality BCI platform that uh, performs SSVEP based neural selections without the need for external computation. This battery powered platform can be put on and taken off in seconds and can be used as a relatively inexpensive uh, assistive BCI if, if, if needs be. Augmented reality truly revolutionizes the utility of exogenous BCI paradigms in a way that the, the sum of the individual technologies is greater than that of its parts. I'm continuing to use this platform in ongoing internal research and there's plenty more work to do to extend the functionality of the platform. If you have any questions, feel free to hit me up at griffin.milsap at jhuapl.edu, and uh, thanks for listening. Great. Thank you, Griffin. If, from uh, the conversation going on in the chat window, it looks like you might have some volunteers to help you out with future research. All right, folks. 
the Q&A session is now open. We have about five minutes, um, although since the break is coming up, we can run longer if we need to. But please enter your questions in the Q&A part of the Zoom interface. Clearly, I did a good job covering everything. No? <laughs> no? Thanks, Phil. Uh, yeah, the, the, the platform, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to work the uh, internal machinations here to get all that released open source. Uh, it is a, um, I, I really want to see this out in the hands of, uh, you know, hobbyists and, and, and enthusiasts, uh, especially considering what I mentioned earlier about the, um, about the existing state there being so um, Thanks, Mark. <laughs> uh, uh, looks like there's actually a question in the chat. Uh, let's see here. Right. Is there any publication on this project or any other uh, public media? Yeah. So actually, this is the first time that this has been disclosed to the public. Uh, there is a uh, publication which has been submitted to IEEE, EMBS, Neural Engineering and Rehabilitation, specifically on the platform. It's more of a technical note, but it's a four-page conference publication. Hasn't been accepted yet, but it's in it's in uh, press, so, or not, not in press, it's in, uh, it's under review. <laughs> Great, we'll look forward to seeing that. Uh, any other comments or questions from the attendees? All right, well, thanks again, Griff. Sweet, thank uh, you. Folks, the, this leads us to the end of the morning session and we'll be resuming again at two o'clock this afternoon. Hope to see you then.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the afternoon session of our first day of the 2021 XR Symposium. Before we start our first presentation, I would like to offer an apology for a mix up regarding the speaker for this presentation. We had a little bit of communication scramble, and although the agenda and schedule list um, so Ms. Daryl Roy as the presenter, we're actually pleased to welcome Wayne Daigle, who is the CTO of 3D Media. So both the presentation and the live Q&A will be featuring Wayne. So let's go to the video. Hi, I'm Wayne Daigle, CTO of 3D Media located in Thibodeau, Louisiana. I'd like to show you how we leverage virtual reality and augmented reality technologies to develop solutions to improve training and maintenance effectiveness for maintainers of the Air Force Global Strike Command at Dias Air Force Base. These solutions did not only directly affect the quality of training, but also indirectly brought improvements to cost and efficiency on the base. To begin, let's take a snapshot of a typical day for an Air Force flight line maintainer. On any given day, they face a wide range of stressful challenges like hazardous work environments, complex tasks, and extremely tight timelines. Quality training and maintenance tools are crucial to safety and effectively completing their task under these conditions. Current training methods involve the traditional death by PowerPoint approach, which studies have shown have only a 20% retention rate. In addition, training sessions are also infrequent, inconsistent, and require an aircraft to stay grounded to facilitate training. These shortcomings leave student maintainers chasing training and certification situations and without the ability to practice emergency scenarios. The goal of our work was to mitigate those risks by developing virtual reality training simulators and augmented reality tools that make airmen more proficient, more efficient, and mission ready. For the Air Force Global Strike Command, we developed a VR training simulator and an AR maintenance tool to perform all servicing on the B-1B bomber for the auxiliary power unit or APU and an accessory drive gearbox or ADG. Currently, APU and ADG servicing is typically over or under serviced due to maintainers missing warning signs of sight gauges. This leads to hot oil temperature and low oil temperature situations on the aircraft that can result in parts breaking down and needing costly replacements. Our VR training simulator uses a digital twin of the B-1B as well as the flight line environment. The digital twin of the B-1B is a 3D model that accurately represents the aircraft size, location of access panels, and the details needed for servicing the APU and the ADG. The training simulator is a single-use experience that runs on an Oculus Quest. Because the Oculus Quest is mobile, the student is not restricted to classroom and instructor availability. Students can iterate training repeatedly in any weather, at any time, and at any location. This approach also provides a safe environment without the risk involved in live training, providing an increase in students' competency and confidence. In addition, instructors recover time usually needed for training to return to their own task and the aircraft requirements for training are reduced, increasing their availability for use in the field. Now I'd like to give you a brief tour of the VR training simulator. A student begins in the hangar lobby where he or she can begin the VR experience by making a selection on the control panel, tutorial, APU, or ADG. The tutorial allows students not familiar with VR to become accustomed to VR controls prior to starting the training. This allows the student to practice using the VR controllers, teleporting, and interacting with tools and objects that are part of the simulator. For both the APU and ADG servicing, there are three modes, training, assessment, and sandbox. The sandbox mode allows for an unstructured exploration of the aircraft, service parts, and environment. The student can teleport freely around the aircraft as well as into the detailed cockpit. The training mode takes the student through each technical order TO step and in order and provides hints along the way. 
For actual APU or ADG servicing, the maintainer must get nece the necessary equipment and tools for the task before proceeding to the flight line. On a regular basis, Dias Air Force Base would see maintainers showing up to the aircraft without retrieving the required equipment tools. So a tool crib was included in our simulation to help reinforce its importance to the student. The student begins the training in the tool crib where he or she must gather the required tools to perform the task. A virtual iPad is used to display the list of required tools. If the student does not gather all the required tools, he or she must acquire all tools before proceeding to the TO checklist to check them off. If the tools gathered are not needed, he or she must put them back. Once the required tools are checked off the TO checklist, the student can proceed to the flight line to perform APU or ADG servicing. Now we move to the flight line. The simulation environment reinforces what the student will see on the job. The specific tools used are shown, as well as the iPad maintainers will use to reference the required TO while performing the procedure. The student must teleport to location of the APU or ADG as directed by the animated arrows and don the required PPE. He or she is then guided through the servicing using voiceover and the TO steps are shown on the virtual iPad. The current elapsed time is shown on the virtual iPad. Animated arrows direct the student where to look or to interact with the digital twin of the B1B. TO steps must be done in a correct order or an error is shown on the virtual iPad. The current elapsed time is shown on the virtual iPad. Animated arrows direct the student where to look or to interact with the digital twin of the B1B. TO steps must be done in a correct order or an error is shown on the virtual iPad. The assessment mode provides the same simulation as the training mode, except the student performs each TO steps without any guidance. Time as well as TO step errors are displayed at the end of the simulation to provide feedback to the student and the instructor. Finally, let's look at the digital twin of the APU and ADG. We can see how these parts and their location on the aircraft are represented realistically so students will easily identify them when performing the procedure live. For training like this to be successful, there must also be a system in place to deploy it and maintain it across different Air Force bases. To sustain and scale the VR training simulator, an XR device management or XRDM system provides device management and health monitoring along with over the air or OTA updates of the simulator. This gives you the ability to, to rapidly update modules for reasons like TO changes, platform alterations, and modernization and eliminates the need for an on-site contractor team and massive added expenses that are currently associated with such updates. The XRDM system consists of a client app that runs on an Android-based headsets like the Oculus Quest and a web portal to manage and monitor headsets and to deploy VR content. But we didn't stop there. Using our AR maintenance tool, Tactile Manifest, we connect maintainers to servicing resources in real time as they perform TO procedures. Manifest allows maintainers to view overlaid TO steps, videos, pictures, notes, and PDF documents while performing actual APU or ADG servicing on the B1B. Manifest can also be used as a training tool by displaying the B1B digital twin as a hologram along with overlaid TO steps, etc. Manifest consists of two parts, a 3D mixed reality MR application and a client web portal. The 3D MR application runs on a Microsoft HoloLens 2 headset. The client web portal runs as an AWS instance and assists in setting up assets with 3D models, asset tags, provisioning users and permissions, and viewing and editing templates where TO steps are authored manually and content is added. There are hundreds of TOs for maintaining the B1B. Therefore, manually authoring templates is time consuming and inefficient. To speed up authoring TO steps to the template, a TO scraping tool was developed. So how does a TO scraping tool work? 
The TO scraping tool extracts and parses the maintenance steps from the TO as JSON and injects the JSON into manifest using the manifest API. This gives you the ability to rapidly update templates due to TO changes. The steps can then be further edited in the client web portal if required. Further authoring is done using the 3D MR application in the HoloLens 2 headset. The asset tag can be a physical or virtual QR code that is placed on the real object or in virtual 3D space. The 3D MR application allows you to place steps and content relative to asset tags, both virtual and real. All content is then anchored to the asset tag location. Once authoring is in the headset is completed, the template can be previewed. A job is then created using the 3D MR application in the headset or in the client web portal and assigned to a maintainer to perform the oil servicing on the B1B. As TO steps are completed, evidence of completion can be left as text, images, voice notes, or video. Team jobs can also be created. So if TO procedures require multiple maintainers to be at different locations of the aircraft, TO steps in a team job can be assigned to a respective maintainer, allowing each maintainer to use manifest and lead their own evidence of TO step completion. Expert Connect allows a maintainer to connect with an expert maintainer using direct video and audio for one-to-one -one calls. This allows the expert maintainer to see what the maintainer sees and provide instruction. Real-time chat is also included, allowing maintainers to share photos, videos, or PDFs. This, of course, requires a Wi-Fi internet connection. If an internet connection is not available at the location where maintenance is being performed, templates and jobs can be taken offline and saved to the HoloLens 2 headset prior to going to the location of the task. The task can then be performed as usual using Manifest. Once connectivity is restored, all offline work will resync with the client web portal server. Based on our development of the VR training, 3D Media was challenged by Dias Air Force Base to perform APU servicing on an actual B1B. Before starting the maintenance procedure, one of the needed tools was missing, a waste container, a bucket, needed to collect oil that overflows when servicing the APU. So one of the maintainers had to run to the tool crib to get one. Based on this occurrence of not having the proper tools, we added a tool crib scenario to the VR training simulator. The APU servicing was completed in just over three minutes with 100% accuracy. Based on that, a comment was made by Lieutenant Colonel regarding how we remembered the TO steps, and our reply was that we retained the information during the development process of the VR training simulator. In conclusion, the AF Global Strike Command approached 3D Media due to challenges they faced with current training methods. 3D Media developed a VR training simulator and an AR tool to perform oil servicing on the B1B for the APU and the ADG and tested it approximately on 50 maintainers. The results were a dramatic reduction in training time from approximately three weeks down to one week. Based on these results, an Air Force Global Strike Command maintenance instructor planned to increase the use of the VR training simulator across the base and also planned to expand the training to cover other B-1B systems. The Air Force is also considering moving forward with implementing manifest to everyday B-1B maintenance tasks. Great, thank you. And now we have Wayne available for live Q&A. So please fire away with your questions. I see we've got one already in the okay. Q&A window. Okay, uh, basically what we did, what tools that we use to generate the digital twin? Uh, we started with actually uh, an off, I'll call it an off the shelf model, uh, a model that can be purchased. And then because of the differences uh, we use a combination of scanning techniques and uh, hand modeling along uh, with that in order to make the changes. Uh, 
the changes in the cockpit, for instance, were uh, quite different. Uh, so we had to make those changes manually, and that was done in uh, software like uh, the team used the combination of Blender, uh, Maya, 3D Studio Max, uh, standard DCC tools, uh, digital content creation tools. Any other questions for Wayne? Oh, here we go. Oh, a couple more coming in. Great. Okay, tools and techniques. Okay, the, the, the TOs are technical orders or the, the standard PDFs. Uh, each different aircraft, depending on the, whether it's an older aircraft or if it's a newer aircraft, they use two different systems. Uh, one system is called the ETIMS, and the other one is IATIMS for the newer aircraft, which typically are owned by companies like Boeing, uh, the, the companies that make the aircraft. Um, what we got was basically the, our Air Force TPOCs, technical points of contact, provided those PDFs of the TOs that were needed for these two uh, all servicing, uh, the ADG and the APU. From that, we developed a TO scraper, which runs, we ran it on a local Linux uh, instance, and it was developed in, uh, it was developed such that it would scrape the TO based on the paragraph or based on the section and subsection. And then it would pull those TO steps and then populate them into manifest. Now on the, that's for the AR side and that was using the manifest API. On the um, VR side, those steps had to basically be created manually. We developed the VR trainer in Unity. And so those were, were uh, built in during the development. Um, let's see, you're using, do you have any issues with having? Um, at the time we weren't using uh, Facebook for a login. That is a concern going forward. Uh, we were just uh, awarded two additional projects that require, uh, that will have, uh, one of them is five more VR trainers for the B1B. And uh, currently we're proceeding with the Oculus Quest 2, but the Air Force has brought up a concern with the issue of having a Facebook login. And I'm, sure some, I'm pretty sure some changes are going to occur on that in the future. Actually, the TO scraper was an in-house solution that was developed in-house. It wasn't an off-the-shelf solution for Manifest. Uh, custom, it was custom done using uh, a Python scraping library. And then uh, basically we just followed the Manifest API in order to uh, authenticate and then push those TO steps to Manifest. Okay, for manifest, actually, yes. I mean, it is possible to identify a real part using AI. We didn't go that route, but uh, manifest currently, uh, the current version supports uses a barcode or, or what they call a digital tag. You can, uh, you can use uh, either a digital tag or a hard copy you know, paper tag. Uh, which would be a barcode. But yes, there, there is a possibility of using AI in order to identify the real part. Uh, it's currently not in, man, in manifest at this point, but uh, moving forward, that is something we are looking at. Now, just going back to one of the earlier questions that I think had two parts and kind of moved on. Uh, did you need to simplify the content models for deployment to the Oculus Quest? Uh, yes, we did have to do some decimation uh, in order to simplify the polygon count. Definitely. Yeah, so because the Oculus Quest sits at standalone and you're not running it off of, you know, uh, either a laptop, a VR laptop or a desktop, uh, you have to be uh, basically prepare your models such that the performance is not hindered on the Quest. Well, looks like we've got a couple more questions coming in. Uh, currently, 
we've had discussions with the Air Force on Manifest uh, and looking at basically uh, moving Manifest on-prem using uh, either uh, the cl their cloud one or platform one or uh, GovCloud uh, in order to, so that we can host AF data. Um, in, in fact, uh, we are in the process of moving forward. We haven't been awarded it yet, but there's been discussions uh, for a phase three SIBR uh, in order to do just that. Uh, as far as custom interactions, yes, we did create custom interactions for each tool for the must for the maintenance task. You're welcome, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any more questions from the attendees? Oh, here we go. Sure, I can provide a copy, definitely. Um, how do we go about doing that, Ari? Uh, the best way to do that is for attendees to contact you and you can provide um, your slides, your video, whatever content um, okay. you are comfortable providing. APL will not be keeping a repository of presentation materials. So okay. if attendees want copies of, of videos or any parts of the presentations, you'll need to contact presenters directly. Okay. Yeah, Brian, if you could uh, basically send me a, a chat directly to me with your email information, I can send that send that information to you, send you a copy of the presentation. Let's see, tag link, we have projects Looks like we've got one more question about tags and anchoring up. Okay, I'm just gonna type my email address here. <laughs> Yeah, there was some difficulty with large objects. Uh, there is so, some difficulty too. The hollow lens, um, especially rendering large objects, uh, you have to be aware. Manifest has, I think it's a 50,000 polygon uh, uh, limitation. They, well, it's not really a limitation, it's a guide. Uh, try to keep your models under 50,000 uh, polys. Um, let's see. Actually, we didn't run into that. Uh, the The model of the digital twin of the B one uh, or the B one B model, um, it stayed pretty uh, pretty well anchored. Uh, didn't move around too much. Uh, and uh, the problem we had, we did even try this out when we were we were out on the flight on the flight line, and uh, you know. Because the hollow lens has limitations, it gets affected by direct sunlight. It's really meant to be used in indoors. We did try uh, some chromatic, uh, basically film to try to minimize that. It did help, but uh, yeah, to be honest, we did have some slight, yeah, some slight issues when anchoring large objects. Now, manifestos also have when you're talking about a, lot, a large area like a hangar. You can have a tag and then you can have like an orientation anchor, a second anchor that helps anchor that, that large object and keep it from moving around. Actually, uh, the, as far as manifest, I was impressed with it, but we did have some feedback from the Air Force. Uh, and it wasn't primarily on manifest. It was more on the current state of the UI and the gestures of HoloLens 2. Um, so we did get some pushback on that. Um, manifest does have some, uh, some issues, well, not issues, some areas they could improve their UI. Uh, we've uh, we basically... Uh, worked with them and I'm sure we're gonna see some changes in the near future. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, and, and 
also on the implementation of uh, putting in templates manually. Um, that's very cumbersome. It's, it's, it's very time consuming. And again, that's why we went ahead and implemented the, the TO scraper to, uh, to assist on that and, and aid the user or the trainer to uh, rapidly uh, get those TO steps in there. Yes, basically it's a second QR code that you would place in a different location and that would uh, help anchor the orientation. Let's see. People are asking for your email. Would you, should yeah. I just go ahead and post it here? Would you like me to do that? Yeah, you can do that. Okay. Um, let's see, do we have any more questions right now? Okay, anyone else? All right, well, we've got a, a few minutes before the next talk is scheduled to begin. So we'll take a break for a couple of minutes and be back for the environmental navigator talk at 2.30. Okay, thank you everyone. And uh, it's great to be part of the symposium. Great. Thank you.
All right, welcome back everyone for our next presentation. The two presenters for this one are Brandon Scott and Ian Hughes, both from APL. And they will be talking about Environmental Navigator, which is a technique for mapping workspaces directly into VR. Let's roll the video, please. I'm Ian Hughes of the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab, and today I'm going to talk to you about the Environmental Navigator project. The objective of the Environmental Navigator project was to demonstrate state-of-the-art methods for capturing workplace environment and converting those images to a set of 3D art that could be used to uh, view a space virtually. We wanted to use methods that had a very low barrier to entry and could be partially automated. This work was done for uh, the ARC, uh, to be used to assist persons with disabilities uh, with worksite navigation and orientation. But this work had other uses uh, in training for dangerous work environments or uh, scene reconstruction for accident investigations. So skilled digital artists and expensive equipment can be used to obviously perfectly recreate an environment virtually, but this is out of scope for many sponsors and projects that may want to create a digital twin uh, on a space quickly and with low cost. So for our demonstration, we used images from one of the uh, cafeterias and kitchen spaces uh, on our campus. And we captured these spaces with a few different tools um, and then followed a process to convert those captures into a 3D mesh that was then imported into the Unity game engine. The Unity game engine was used to convert those 3D images into a virtual environment that can then be experienced in virtual reality uh, with any VR headset. Uh, I'm gonna show a video walkthrough of the space to orient everyone and then show off some results of our methods. So we explored two methods for this demonstration, stereo depth sensing and photogrammetry. Uh, the first uses specific hardware to sense the depth of the environment, and the second uses regular digital uh, image or video captures of the environment at the same focal length but different angles in order to recreate the depth of the environment through post-processing. Uh, there are some other methods listed here that we did not explore but may produce similar results and we will discuss that at the end of the presentation. So first, uh, these are, are talk a little bit about the two methods that we're using. So the first method is stereo depth sensing, uh, which uses uh, stereoscopic cameras to observe both the scene and take three-dimensional uh, depth data for objects in the field in the field of uh, field of view. This method is generally performed in three steps. First, you have image capture, uh, 3D reconstruction and then followed by model cleanup. The imaging ca Im image capturing phase is uh, doing a camera tour of the physical environment uh, with uh, in real time and then capturing images in real time with the Z mini camera. Um, the real time sensor data from the Z is transferred to a computer program called ZFoo. So the 3D reconstruction is live and this program uh, converts that collected data into a rough 3D model which has uh, blemishes and artifacts inter introduced by uh, any poor image quality that you have there. Um, these blemishes and errors are observed as uh, holes and distortions and extra geometry um, that'll show up in the model. Um, so then we can use that 3D model uh, for cleanup where the errors and the artifacts are repaired if possible and removed as necessary. Pre-made 3D items uh, may also be added to the compensate for items the process cannot satisfy, uh, satisfactorily render. Um, so in the modeling cleanup and additions phase, uh, we used 3D modeling software such as Blender um, to remove the blemishes. Um, other software applications such as Unity uh, were used to view the model in VR uh, for accuracy and also insert the extra objects um, desired. Uh, to, to clean up the model. We found while using the Z that the model um, it reconstructed um, was very low quality. Uh, there were a lot of blemishes and errors, um, and even the model and cleanup would not reach the level of realism that we desired. Um, so we desired, we uh, focused on the second method for this, for this project, uh, for the model cleanup phase. So this approach is photogrammetry. Um, photogrammetry works by taking multiple pictures of a 3D object from different angles and using software to reconstruct the objects in 3D from those images. In the image capturing phase, you 
we used a DSLR camera to take multiple images of the 3D environment from different angles. Um, and because the environment was so large, several videos were actually used for our method. So that was a, uh, a way of getting a large collection of images very quickly. This video was then broken into separate frames and images that we used uh, by the software in the next phase. So the program we used for 3D reconstruction uh, was called Meshroom. Uh, Meshroom is a commonly used photogrammetry uh, reconstruction software, and it takes in a series of images and reconstructs a 3D model. And this is done offline in post-processing. So on average, you need a couple hundred images that are fed into the program. Um, and of course, that varies in the size of the object or the environment that you're trying to capture. And the reconstruction phase takes several hours, um, even on a VR-ready computer um, or, or a powerful, powerful machine. So it takes a few hours. Um, so we'll uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about what kind of computers we used later later on. So the 3D model of uh, Meshroom um, was then transferred over to do modeling cleanup uh, and additions. Um, using uh, Blender and Unity, as I discussed before, it was the same process that you would use for the stereo depth sensing. Um, however, the photogrammetry created a better model to start with from the 3D reconstruction phase. So we actually focused our model cleanups efforts in this project on the photogrammetry, and we did not actually clean up the, the Z output. OK, so these two animations. Uh, show how each of, each of these methods work um, with ZFU and the Meshroom software. Um, the important thing to note here um, is that stereo depth sensing, which is shown um, on the left, uh, forms the 3D reconstruction as more as more of the space is captured. So you can kind of see in the image that the, um, the stone wall here that's being formed is, uh, is, is, being, is, is, is appearing as uh, the camera is being moved and the space is captured. Photogrammetry, on the other hand, um, requires several Im images that are taken, uh, that are taken and then fed into the program, and the, and the model is recreated uh, by using all of those images in a post-processing step. So this is showing here on the right that there are lots and lots of images that are taken in different angles, and it's placing them into the scene, and then using uh, using those images in order to uh, create a a uh, point cloud. Okay, so now I'm going to show um, a video uh, that is a walkthrough of the space that we captured for this demonstration. Um, this is a, a cafeteria and a kitchen, a professional kitchen that is on our campus. Um, so this first area here is the cafeteria section, which has a salad bar and a coffee station. And this is where the users uh, pick up their food and, and pay for it. And then we also captured the uh, back room of the kitchen behind the counter. So this is like the grill area where um, where people would work. And then here we enter the uh, prep area and storage, um, as well as some ovens and refrigerators and stuff. And then the final space is this uh, cleaning area on the next side. Okay, now we're going to show some results of the uh, two different captures that we made, as well as an output from the simple cleanup that we did in Blender and Unity. Uh, to make this easy to follow, we made a computer camera follow along with the actual camera that I showed uh, that I just showed in the walkthrough video. The original walkthrough video is in the upper left of this quad view. Um, the stereo depth sensing results are shown in the upper right and the photogrammetry results are shown in the lower right. The final result of the Unity cleanup on the photogrammetry model is then shown in the lower left.
Okay, so I'm going to pause here. Um, this is the first example of what we think is a good capture um, of both the uh, Z as well as the Meshroom uh, cameras here. When you have a bunch of objects that um, you know are kind of lumpy and have a lot of corners and edges um, and are various colors, um, both of these uh, sensing captures do a pretty good job of uh, recreating those those areas. Um, so this kind of required no cleanup. Uh, we thought this this uh, pretzel stand here uh, came together pretty well without uh, without too much effort. Okay, so this is an example of, of a space where um, the reconstruction really helped a lot. Uh, Meshroom did a decent job of uh, capturing this area. Um, however, we um, we bought some uh, some models of Unity and some assets um, on the asset store and kind of replaced the the salad bar with some of those models. Um, it's not a perfect reconstruction, um, but it definitely uh, allows you to tell what this object is, where where with the uh, meshroom capture, the shiny surfaces on this thing would, uh, or actually it was the black surfaces on this thing would not show up, as you can see here in the video, um, but replacing it makes it a little more obvious what it is. Okay, right here, um, this is a good example of a place where photogrammetry also has issues. Um, the shadow on the wall of the video right here um, and up here, these dark spots did not get captured well by the photogrammetry method. Um, so they needed to be filled in um, in the Unity. You can see here that there's giant, giant blemishes and holes uh, that were formed in the photogrammetry and we filled them in with a you know, pretty easily with a with a wall uh, here that had a texture that was similar. It still doesn't look that great, but at least it's not um, a hole. And then also this, um, the bar here for the grill um, also had a lot of holes and blemishes. You can actually see some of the windows across the room and things were not coming through here. So it had to be filled in as well with uh, with the models that we that we purchased. Okay, I want to point out here, um, this has already been shown a lot, but um, the general floor and the ceiling were actually replaced in the Unity uh, reconstruction. Um, it's hard to see here, but there's a lot of uh, holes and blemishes in the ceiling. The, the ceiling was not captured well. Uh, we probably could have done a better job getting more images of the ceiling, um, but given that there was a lot of blemishes on the ceiling in the Unity reconstruction, I actually removed it and replaced it with a textured wall or a textured uh, surface. Same with the floor as well, um, where I used uh, one good capture of the floor and then sort of repeated it as a texture along um, along the floor so that a lot of the a lot of the blemishes on the floor were removed. And you'll see that throughout the, the whole scene. Okay, so this is another example of where the uh, meshroom uh, photogrammetry capture was unable to get this work table that's here um, with all these shiny objects. It just completely failed to get that portion uh, of the floor um, as well as the work table itself. So this is pretty obvious that you can see the entire floor has been replaced with a nice smooth texture. Um, and we put in a work table where that 
table goes. This isn't a very good reconstruction here. Probably should spend a little more time on this art um, and placing some objects on it, but I feel like it's a pretty good stand-in um, for uh, what is mostly completely unrecognizable in, in this capture here. And then you can also see that the some things do get captured well, like the front of that oven is uh, pretty recognizable in, in the uh, in the mushroom capture. So, so I wanted to show one final thing here, um, where this is another example of a pretty good capture, um, where this object that uh, has a lot of edges and surfaces um, and colors as well gets captured well by um, all of the, um, well, not the Z method, but the mesh room and the Unity. Um, well, it's the same thing, uh, but there is a, a pretty good capture here. It didn't require a lot of cleanup except for some of the holes in the walls. So. Um, and I'm going to end the video here. Um, so now I'm going to pass you over to uh, Brandon Scott, who uh, is going to um, speak to uh, some of our conclusions about this project. So Ian talked about in the video he just showed you certain reconstructions that worked and certain reconstructions that didn't work. So when it comes to the reconstructions that didn't work, there are some reasons for that. And here are the pitfalls that you need to avoid if you want to also follow this. So photogrammetry works by pixel to pixel comparison between the images that are snapped from different angles showing the same feature. And anything that goes or gets in the way of that process is a problem. So here are some common pitfalls to avoid. If an image is out of focus, it's hard to do a pixel to pixel comparison between the images because all the pixels are averaged out. If an object is shiny, that means from looking at it from one angle versus looking at it from another angle, it's very hard because the light messes up the pixel to pixel comparison. So it'll be a different image almost. Very tiny objects are hard to see already, and it's hard to compare those pixels. Dark shadows pose a problem because to the naked eye, it looks like just a, a darker tone of the same object. However, when you zoom in, there's a lot of noise in that shadow. So when you compare one image to another in that certain region that you're trying to compare them, they look like two different images. Motion blur offers the same problem as out of focus. It's blurry, hard to compare those pixels. Transparency has the problem of being able to see through the object. So if you're seeing through the object, you can't really see the 3D shape of the object itself, for instance, glass. Plane features offer the problem of not having enough detail. So everything kind of looks flat. So if you were to try to use photogrammetry on the wall, things would look distorted because it can't tell the 3D shape because the pixels are just all the same. And crisscrossing is the problem where, for instance, let's say you're trying to look at a tree and reconstruct a tree. The leaves in the foreground and the leaves in the background crisscross as you go across the tree. So you can't really tell the difference between the leaves in the foreground and the leaves in the background. So these are common pitfalls to avoid. But we also want to focus on rules and best practices. How do you do this correctly? Well, the more images you have, the better. Of course, it's going to slow down your processing time, but the images look better. The higher resolution, the better. Once again, pixel to pixel comparison. The more pixels you have, the better your 3D model comes out. And every point of the scene needs to be seen from at least two pictures. And those pictures need to be not spread out too far away from each other in terms of angle. So at least less than 30 degrees between the two. So generally, photogrammetry is used to take pictures of smaller objects or pictures around an object. Our project was different in the fact that we were going, taking pictures from the inside out instead of the outside in. So we had to take pictures all around us. 
And that posed a lot of problems in terms of reconstructing things because we may have not gotten certain features from this angle that we need to have gotten from. So once we do all of this, the goal is to be able to view these 3D models. And the best way to kind of get a, a sense of the thing that you've already reconstructed is by placing them in virtual reality. So although we had the pitfalls and problems with this model, we were still able to place Ian into the, the virtual reality model. So the thing is about this is that Ian was never in this kitchen. He's never experienced this kitchen before. So he was a good test subject to see how real this could possibly be. So even with all of the problems that we encountered, Ian did get a good sense that it was a kitchen. And he also, also has the feeling that if he were to go in that kitchen in real life, he would be able to easily navigate through it. So if you want to follow the same process that we did, we have a table here with five steps. First, you want to capture the images and capture as many images as possible. You'll need photography skills to avoid those pitfalls that we talked about earlier and need to have some type of hardware like a DSLR camera. Step two is to take those images and feed them into a 3D reconstruction program like Meshroom. And you'll need a laptop or a desktop computer that is powerful enough to run Meshroom. Third, you'll need to be able to clean up after Meshroom uh, in, in the situations in which it's having problems reconstructing objects. So you'll probably need to clean that up with a 3D modeling software like Blender. The fourth step is adding in additional models. Now, once again, Meshroom may not have the ability to reconstruct models to our liking. And sometimes it's better to just scrap those reconstructions and have models that are already pre-made that come close to the thing that it was trying to reconstruct. Last of all is being able to turn this into a VR application or something in which the user is able to go in and be able to interact with this or view it from the different angles is try to get that good comparison. So of course, there are other methods that we didn't look at. For instance, LiDAR. And this is basically a light scanning process. So here you have this beam that shines light on its environment. And when the light bounces back, that gives you a 3D understanding of the environment. So for instance, you have this camera that kind of goes around and scans the environment in circles and loops and comes back with this image on how the environment looks. The only problem with LiDAR right now is that we don't think the resolution is high enough. For instance, they have a LiDAR built into the iPhone, the new iPhone that's coming out. And still, you can see from this picture here below, that the reconstruction of the room, I believe this is a living room, is still too coarse to understand exactly what you're looking at. So another method that we didn't look at was the panorama. You may be familiar with this if you ever placed the little orange man in Google Maps onto a street and you were able to see a street view. This is basically a spherical picture surrounding you where you're able to see the entire environment. The problem with this is that it doesn't offer any depth. So, you're basically looking at a flat image painted onto the sphere. So there are other companies like Matterport that are taking Panorama and combining it with other approaches that scan the environment, for instance, photogrammetry, and combining them all together to come up with this Google Street View slash actual real mesh. So they offer their software as a service. They can come to your environment snap the pictures, upload it to their servers, do processing on it, and provide these hybrid approaches. Last of all, we'd like to acknowledge the ARC, a nonprofit organization that promotes and protects the rights of people with IDD, or intellectual and developmental disabilities. And that is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you, Brandon and Ian. We have just a few minutes here for questions. So if you have questions or comments for Brandon and Ian, please uh, enter them in the, the Q&A section of the Zoom interface. Uh, I do see we've got one comment coming in through the, the chat box mentioning Reality Capture, which is another software for 3D scanning that um, Mike has heard to be more accurate than Meshroom. Are you guys familiar with that? Do you have any comments on that? I've heard of it, but I hadn't had a chance to actually use it. I remember that's like that's an, another option to Meshroom, but haven't actually tried it out. All right. Well, we've got a 
question. So, yeah, I have a question. So have you thought of using machine learning to attempt to finish the rendering? Uh, maybe using LiDAR to train a model, to recreate a room, building, et cetera, compared to the other altern alternatives you mentioned. I don't know if this would be less or more expensive. Uh, I really personally, I personally believe that um, machine learning would take this to the next level. I haven't seen any research out there that's basically we could jump on and like actually use, but I've seen examples of that that has been able to take pictures of human beings and be able to kind of not only tell the, the, the surface or the 3D structure of the human being, but able to extrapolate to what's behind them and what the textures look like on that. So it'd be interesting to see in the future what happens with machine learning in terms of all types of different objects in that case. Uh, so we haven't actually played with the LiDAR, but that would also also be interesting. Okay, we've got, a, oh, got several more questions coming in. Yeah, <laughs> trying to keep track of them all. So have you gone back to the ARC to try a more detailed higher image capture? So we haven't had the chance to actually do that. Unfortunately, the, the pandemic hit the same moment that we were in the process of doing that. So no, we, we didn't have the actual opportunity to do that, just the kitchen. So the next question by Griffin. Are there any existing object identification software that can benefit from 3D imaging or perhaps do a dense uh, segmentation and augment reality? Um, I'm not sure the actual, Ian, maybe you can, if you have any. Um, is this a similar question to the, to the AI machine learning kind of thing? Like object identification, I assume you're talking about yeah. machine learning. Yeah, I mean, I think you kind of answered that already. We're not aware. I yeah. mean, I, I think we've seen stuff like that before, but we have not, uh, we did not use that in this project um, and didn't identify yeah. whether, what, what its cost would be. <laughs> so another question, did you have any luck with uh, 3D images or three, 360 images in photogrammetry? So we haven't, so we didn't have time to actually explore the 360 images, but a cool idea that we had like kind of uh, going in our heads is what if we can merge the two together? So kind of have a Google Maps approach, but kind of uh, snap pictures in between every area. So kind of take a, so kind of snap pictures every few centimeters and see if we can interpolate in between. So as you kind of move around the room in VR, the, the panorama would kind of update. So we don't know how that would look. Maybe it would be too jittery, but It'd be cool to look into that and see what would happen. So the next question from Brandon, nice name. Uh, did, <laughs> did you consider other color spaces? Um, this may help mitigate the shadow issues. We have not looked into that. Uh, we just looked into actual, uh, just using whatever comes out through the DSLR camera. But yeah, that would be interesting to see how that would kind of overcome the noise issues and kind of for like maybe the shadow, the shadow issues that we encountered. So, uh, I, think Brand have, I think we've got time for about one more question here. Okay, Brandon, I answered your question. Sorry, I'm gonna have to go to Tom. Uh, seems like lighting could have been an issue with the photograph, uh, the photographic method. Method, uh, a, pro a pro photographer could have set up. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, if if, if this was a more professional. Uh, if we had more skills when we were taking the photos, yeah, I, I believe that uh, that would definitely improve our our ability to recreate these three D models. Definitely, mm -hmm. but then that increases the expense and complexity of capturing them. Absolutely. Yeah, that was some of the reason for this project was could, could someone with low skills do this, and so that you could just be like, here's here's a uh, you know here's a procedure in order to recreate what we did. If I can quickly answer Brandon's question, the Z does not perform well in indoors. For some reason, they, they, they even have it on their website. It just doesn't do well. All right. Thank you, Ian, Brandon. Um, now we need to move on to our next talk. Our next presentation is from Connor Piles, who's from APL's Human Performance and Biomechanics team. And we'll be hearing about augmented reality-based rehabilitation of gate mechanics and other applications of medical AR. So let's go to the video, please.
Hi, my name is Connor Piles, and I'll be talking about augmented reality-based rehabilitation of gait impairments and other applications of medical AR that I found really interesting and I wanted to, to share based on my time at the Medical Augmented Reality Summer School uh, this past summer. So as far as what we'll talk about today, I'm going to actually spend a good amount of time talking about other projects at the conference. Um, I think that there was a lot of very interesting topics discussed there. And so I'll also provide the, the information for some of the keynote speakers in case you're interested in reaching out or, or looking up some of their published work. Um, and then we'll get into a, a brief discussion of um, the project that I actually participated in during the conference. It was kind of a hackathon style conference where you get put into teams and you actually try to create a new capability um, using augmented reality. And we were actually able to, to make something I thought was pretty cool and actually do some human subjects research and get a, um, a small publication out of it. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about that. So in terms of conference details, um, I do really wanna just kind of plug this conference. It was a great, it was a great experience and I would highly recommend it to anyone that's able to attend. It takes place every summer um, and, and it's not always in, in Zurich, but this, the one that I attended was in at the University Hospital in Balgrist, um, Zurich. Um, and basically the structure of it is set up that you have the, the first week of the summer school is set up in terms of lectures and keynotes and your kind of learning skills and capabilities necessary to be successful in AR-based development and AR applications to medicine. And then the second week you get put into teams of three or four and you work on a hackathon, like I mentioned before, where you're, you're actually trying to create a capability uh, <clears throat> and, and then create that demo and, and, and how it might be useful. Okay, so um, in case you are interested in, in looking up some of the keynote speakers, um, I've provided a list here. Um, I would definitely encourage you to, to, to reach out to them individually or look up some of their publications. Um, I don't claim to be an expert in augmented reality. Um, I was just very interested in learning more about applications of augmented reality in medicine, um, which is why I attended this conference. Um, but these are some of the leading researchers in this field, so, so definitely um, make sure to take a look. In terms of the kind of technical focus areas, um, I think that it was actually very, very heavily focused on surgical applications of augmented reality. Um, I'll talk about several examples of these, but a common theme was kind of you know, being able to co-register different visuals um, while operating um, in the surgical theater. So being able to overlay things like CT or X-ray images onto an actual individual so that it, in a sense gives you kind of that X-ray vision, right? So that you can have a, a more informed kind of tool placement or, um, you know, install of a, of a certain surgical device. Um, it's also used for um, tool placement and path planning. So actually mapping out, you know, in order to avoid certain arteries or organs that you, that you might have to avoid during a surgery, um, kind of displaying a, an optimal path for whether it's arthroscopic surgery or, or things like that. Um, some other use cases that were presented were heads up displays so that you can kind of get all of your information in terms of patient vital signs all in one place without having to look around from monitor to monitor. And then there was also training applications. So um, being able to use AR to simulate what it's like to operate on a, a real human um, by kind of augmenting physical surrogates using some sort of AR overlay. And then there were there were some other focus areas that were kind of scattered in. So rehabilitation, um, that's actually what we focused on as part of our hackathon, um, but also telepresence, um, applications of human-centered design and, and how to think about how the, the patient or the surgeon might interact with an AR technology to make them more or less likely to adopt um, this pretty cutting edge technology. And then actually kind of nitty gritty implementations of AR, right? So actually, how are you doing some of the scripting, under, understanding shading, um, occlusion, things like that. 
So I'll just do a, a brief overview with some visuals. Um, this is a visual medium after all, right? So uh, I, I just want to kind of sh show some some of the uh, key takeaways from the various keynote speakers in the hopes that it would kind of inspire you in some of the work that you do. So this first one um, that Dr. Sandra Michael Heining um, presented on was a training tool. And so it's a combination of a physical surrogate, which you can see here on the left. Um, this would be for um, spinal surgeries where you're having to insert pedicle screws into the, into the vertebrae. And you can see on the right, the AR overlay of what you would see. So by registering where the user's head is with respect to um, certain landmarks on the physical surrogate, they can co-register this image of, okay, this is where you actually need to insert um, a, a pedicle screw. And the tube there kind of represents the, um, the, the spinal cord and it's something obviously you would not want to puncture. And so it, it kind of allows them to train on a, a surrogate system while also giving them some guidance on the appropriate way to perform these surgeries. Um, this was a very similar application and uh, this was a talk led by Dr. Greg, Greg Osgood um, at, from Johns Hopkins University. And he was using a very similar um, style of training for arthroscopic knee surgeries. So again, on the left, you can see kind of him there working with a couple of his residents and on the right, you can see the the AR view and X-ray view, um, basically of a training again a training surrogate. And the, a little bit of a difference here is they're actually able to kind of co-register the X-ray with the training surrogate. So they're getting kind of two pieces of information in one view rather than having to look up at an X-ray screen. I mentioned this briefly, and I think it's just worth kind of showing um, how cluttered an operating room can get. And so both visually, um, in terms of all the screens that you're, you're, you're having to um, digest information from, um, while, you know, potentially in the middle of a very delicate surgery and you're having to look up from what you're doing to, to, to monitor certain um, vitals, uh, but also audio, right? You're, you're getting this, these kind of constant beeping and, and, and different audio signals. And so the idea is that AR might provide at least one part of the puzzle in terms of consolidating this to a, a central HUD that kind of follows whatever, wherever your view is so that you don't, you're not having to look up from what you're doing. Um, and ideally, it's not all presented to you at once, right? That would still be information overload. And so it's understanding contextual cues based on what the surgeon is actually doing at a specific time providing the relevant information to them, whether that's automated or whether there's some tech sitting in another room that's, you know, toggling the information that is displayed to the surgeon. At a little bit more um, kind of detailed level, uh, Dr. Ulrich Eck presented on um, spatial relationship patterns for augmented reality in surgery. And so, one thing that's really, really important to get right if you're trying to use augmented reality uh, in this kind of a precise environment is registration. And so it's easy to get wrong. It's easy to co-register things incorrectly so that, say, if you wanted to overlay an X-ray um, over a human, they, there might be slight mismatches in terms of orientation or translation. Um, and the math can get pretty complicated. And so uh, Dr. Eck has been working on this um, establishment of these patterns that are very common and kind of get used a lot in the, the kind of calibration world. And, it, and ideally, it, it makes it a little bit more modular and plug and play in terms of calibrating your equipment. And so if this is something you're interested in, if, if you need to set up a lab where you're performing these co-registrations, I would recommend taking a look at his work because he's really simplified the workflow for getting these co-registrations correct and, and has kind of, you know, it doesn't make sense to reinvent the wheel where, where he's already kind of um, streamlined this, this pipeline. Um, one of the last things I'll talk about in terms of other projects at the conference is the CAM-C um, or Camera Augmented Mobile C-Arm. 
so a C-arm is, is simply a multi-planar, an x-ray that you can adjust to take images in, in several planes. Um, the idea here is that the cam C is, has been augmented with a video camera that you can see um, mounted on the actual chassis of, of the C-arm, which again, going back to the, the previous slide, takes some thought on how to co-register these using kind of hand-eye calibration. Um, and and what, it, what they're able to provide is a co-registration of X-ray and RGB video um, like you can see on the right. And so it kind of, this is, this is actually an ankle on the right here, a cadaver ankle, and you're actually able to co, you're able to essentially have x-ray vision, right? You're able to see what the um, hardware placement and what maybe like fracture locations look like inside of the patient while you're looking at them. Again, rather than having to kind of um, spatially resolve these two separate images in your mind. You can just see them overlaid directly on one on top of the other. So this is really promising work and it's actually a fairly low cost implementation. Um, and so this is something that I would definitely recommend taking out. Dr. Nir Nasir Nawab, who presented on this, is the chair of the conference. Um, and he is definitely one of kind of the pioneers and longstanding um, advocates of medical-based AR. So definitely well worth checking out his work. I'll speak briefly on telepresence. This was something that came up in multiple talks and demos. Um, and so there is kind of ongoing work in um, providing a telepresence uh, in, in various medical scenarios, right? And so, again, this really, really depends on some of those, those co-registration things I was talking about. And because it's, it's kind of two sets of systems, right? On the receiving end, on the left here, you have this system of, of whatever type of camera system you're using, whether it's RGB or motion tracking, that is trying to locate individuals in a room and provide pose estimation. And then in some remote room that you see on the right here, they're then projecting a some sort of visual of those images up um, with respect to an AR headset that another operator is wearing. And so there's lots of nuances in terms of registration to figure out here as well as just the um, kind of real-time lag in terms of data streaming between the two. And so there's a lot of research going on here and how to make this as um, seamless of a process as possible. You could have a whole talk on this though, so I'm not gonna dive into it, but definitely worth checking out. Uh, finally, um, this is one of the other training tools. It's called the Magic Mirror. It's not AR in the strict sense of like an AR headset, but the idea here is that there is essentially just a cheap, they use the Microsoft Connect, um, which is a um, infrared based kind of pose estimation tool. And what it allows you to do is you, you can imagine you're looking at a monitor. So this individual on the left here is actually looking towards a, a screen that is displaying an image of themselves overlaid with a skeleton that has been scaled to fit the size of their body. And then they're allowed to kind of do various hand gestures to move through that skeleton and explore various aspects of their anatomy, whether it's um, kind of the bone structure, the cardiovascular structure, et cetera. Um, and so this can be used with anatomy students to provide a kind of more hands-on learning environment to see how the body functions, right? And so I think this is actually a really cool tool for AR as more of an instructional capability. So if you're interested in that, look up Magic Mirror. And finally, we'll talk about my project. Um, so what you'll see here in the video is an AR kind of parkour course is what we called it. Um, so what you're seeing is an individual walking along this course. You can see the guide arrows guiding them through. Um, and we just created various obstacles for them to navigate. Here, you're supposed to walk on over the stream using these rocks. You also notice that intermittently these kind of math, simple math equations pop up. That's to make sure that the individual isn't too focused on exactly how they're moving, that it's kind of a, it's, it's in a sense also testing cognitive load, right? Are they able to navigate this course effectively while also being engaged in some simple math problems, right? And, and the idea of it, 
the person you're seeing on the left is actually one of my team members, but the idea of it is that you could use a course like this to provide some stimulus for gait retraining for someone that um, had, had undergone a stroke, right? And so often those individuals will drag their feet um, or, or not go through the full range of motion that they're capable of. And so by prompting them through this kind of more complex movement pattern than maybe they're typically um, used to, you can stimulate engagement of their musculature in, in new ways that could be um, assistive in their rehabilitation. And so um, the IRB review process is slightly different in Switzerland. And so we were actually able, with the help of one of my team members who is a, a practicing uh, doctor there, uh, get a human subjects research protocol established to actually bring in a stroke patient during the conference and test this concept out. So on the left, you can see the system we used. Um, uh, he's using a HoloLens 2, which you know just shows shows the um, kind of the parkour course for him. You'll also notice that he is wearing a set of IMU sensors. So this, these are Xsense IMUs, and they basically just provide pose estimation for his lower extremities. Um, if if you if we go back real quickly to the previous slide, you'll see that when the user looks down at their feet, they're actually seeing an overlay of a virtual skeleton. So this is the Xsense interpretation of, of where their body is relative to where it actually is. So it's not perfect. It was something we kind of hacked together. Um, but the cool thing about that is it allows for collision detection with objects. So if they, if they for example, don't step over an object, they, we could detect that and add that to maybe a score um, to see how they're progressing through time. Um, what it also allows us to do is the Xsense tracks joint angles through time. And so it allows us to assess just what I spoke to earlier. Are they going through a, fuller, a, a more complete range of motion compared to what they might normally? And so what you see here on the right is um, a plot of knee flexion extension angles. Um, there's various iterations of it. So you, right, you, you're gonna go through various cycles of of walking during during one single course. And so that's why there's so many lines. But on the top plot you see, this is where we just had him walk basically 10 feet back and forth normally. And you can see pretty low um, range of motion in terms of total degrees, the magnitude, and also very consistent movement. But when we had him move through the AR course, you'll see that consistently he got the magnitude much higher in terms of the, the range of motion that his knee was moving through. And it was also a lot more varied. So we think that this helped him stimulate um, some of his musculature in a way that he might not have been used to. So we think this is really promising and something that could be applicable both to rehabilitation, but it could also be applicable to things like training scenarios for um, athletic or military populations. And with that, I'll end my presentation and open the room for questions. Thank you. All right. We've got Connor ready to take your questions. And it looks like the, the first question is about the link that you shared, wondering if that's only valid yeah. from APL. Can you provide the link again? Yeah. Yeah, that that was my oversight. That is an APL link, but I'm not sure if we're sharing. It's, it's basically just some of the information I presented in the slides. I'm not sure if we're sharing these slides externally um, or not, but yeah, unfortunately that is an APL link. Okay, so maybe attendees who are interested could contact you and you can, can double check on whether yep. they can share it externally. Yep, absolutely. Feel free. Great. All right, any other questions from the audience? I was particularly interested in the magic mirror. How large a screen were they looking at? Yeah, I think it was a pretty large one, probably probably uh, 40 to 50 inches. Um, but yeah, some of it, it's pretty cool. Some of the, I, I think it's openly available if I, um, if I remember correctly. Um, and basically all it takes is a connect um, to implement. And yeah, you're able to kind of 
like I said, toggle between different, um, you know, whether it's the muscular system or the cardiovascular system and kind of peel away those different layers so that you can kind of see how things are articulating in real time, which is helpful for anyone that's kind of tried to go through an anatomy, anatomy book before and figure out where everything is. Mm -hmm. so. A couple more questions coming in on the Q&A yeah. chat. Yeah, so um, Lee Ming um, had the question for the operating room, what do you see as the big challenges for the surgeons? Um, Honestly, I, I don't know if this is a challenge for the surgeons, but the, the biggest question or the biggest challenge is um, adaptation, adaptation of this technology um, by the surgeons. So a lot of surgeons are pretty hesitant to, to actually use AR technologies um, in the operating room. I, to my knowledge, nothing in the U.S. has really used AR extensively. Um, there's been some surgeries in Germany that have used it. Um, one of the key kind of technical limitations that are that's holding it back and holding us back kind of have, from having that confidence is the precision of that co-registration that I spoke to. Um, right now, you're on the order of, you know, a, a couple of a millimeters to a centimeter in terms of registration. And if you can imagine, if you're off by that much during a surgery, you could potentially sever an artery or, or nick a nerve or something. So there are definitely some kind of registration and precision issues that we'll need to progress before this is something that's widely used in an actual operating room. That being said, I think surgeons are using it for training um, um, up and coming surgeons. So. I think that um, kind of addresses the next question. Yeah, I think so. Um, again, actually being used in surgery, I think we're a little bit of a way from there or, or being used to actually do any kind of really detailed path planning. We're a ways out. But training, telepresence, um, th those things I think are currently being used in medical practice. Um, yeah. All right. Any more questions? Um, all right. Anything else from the audience? Great. All right. Well, thank you again for. Uh, Joining us today, oh, well, we do have another question. <laughs> Just in the nick of time. Yeah, uh, okay, so Li Ming asked for path planning. Is qualitative info good enough, um, if not quantitative? Um, yeah, I think you'd have to ask the surgeons what's useful for them. I mean, I do think, uh, like I said, for training purposes, potentially qualitative information of you know, so you can kind of see in real time where where are some of these entry points for surgery that you need to access certain parts of the anatomy could be helpful just in kind of relatively speaking, where are different aspects of the anatomy. Um, so I, I certainly I think it can be useful. Um, I think the the kind of holy grail, though, like I said, is is basically giving surgeons x-ray vision, right, um, which is you, you would have to be much more precise in order to accomplish that. So. Great. All right. Well, with that, thank you, Connor. Um, our next talk is scheduled to start at 3.30. So we'll take a short break and please join us again in six minutes. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Let's get started on our last talk of this afternoon's session. The presenter is James Dean from APL. James is my colleague in the XR Collaboration Center, and he'll be talking about the Battle of the Hand Trackers. Woo! Hello there. I'm James Dean, and I am part of APL's XR Collaboration Center. Our top objective is to provide a centralized resource hub of knowledge and expertise in immersive technology internally for APL and for our sponsors. A big part of that means keeping track of such technology and being fully aware of their capabilities such that we can provide answers to questions teams may have when their tasks include XR technology. Questions such as, is virtual reality more suited to this project than augmented reality? Or what hardware allows for eye tracking and how robust is that capability? Uh, having answers to these sorts of questions freely available saves those teams precious time and resources that they would otherwise spend researching on their own instead of putting towards their tasks. That's where this presentation is coming from. In the last year and a half, the HoloLens 2 headset released to consumers with greatly improved hand tracking capability compared to the HoloLens 1. And around the same time, the Oculus Quest headset was released, uh, enabling their experimental hand tracking capability to all headsets in early 2020. So the XRCC team wanted to have a fairly good assessment of their tracking capabilities in the event teams would include it into their projects and at least be aware of their limitations. So first off, what is the point of having hand tracking capabilities in immersive technology? Well, having such a capability has two major advantages. First, it greatly improves the immersive aspect of the experience. Of course, all immersive hardware uses your hands as a workhorse of interaction within your XR environment, uh, whether it be through your hands directly as with the HoloLens headsets or through controllers with pretty much any other XR hardware. But removing the physical controller removes a layer of disconnection between you and your immersive experience. It grants you a greater depth of immersion, uh, in other words. It additionally enables a greater level of freedom and control over using controllers where you're limited to the buttons on the controllers themselves. But besides the improved immersion, it also means that the hardware becomes more portable, and that portability means easier adoption for the intended audiences. In this context, I compared the Oculus Quest with the H HTC Vive. The, the Vive requires lighthouses, controllers, and a tethered headset, along with the need of additional software for a PC, whereas a Quest is wireless and fully self-contained. So showcasing a project to sponsors with the Vive means having to transport, set up, and possibly even troubleshoot the hardware and software. With the Quest, at least, all you need to do is load the application onto the headset, put the headset into a container, and then send the container on its way. It is fully self-contained. You just turn it on, select the, select the application, and you're good to go. So eliminating the need for controllers via hand tracking significantly improves the portability of the hardware, thereby improving the uh, ability for the audience to adopt the technology and to collaborate. Now, this is a critically important aspect that can make or break the success of your application and really should not be overlooked. Before I go into the assessments between the two headsets, I'd like to note the hardware being used for each headset that enables hand tracking. Uh, the HoloLens 2 has a 1 megapixel time of flight depth sensor located in the center of the front plate, which, uh, which really is a specialized LiDAR sensor. Um, and it works pretty well for a majority of tracking situations, uh, but tends to have some problems distinguishing between physical objects or really their shapes and orientations when they're in close proximity to each other. And I'll go into that in more de detail further in this presentation. Uh, the Quest, on the other hand, uses four wide angle monochrome cameras placed near the upper and lower corners of the front plate to generate a stereoscopic understanding of its physical space. While that has the disadvantage of not being able to measure depth from physical objects directly, the Quest is able to track hands or really to guesstimate with a high degree of accuracy uh, with the use of machine learning, learning algorithms developed by Facebook Labs. Now, 
the hand tracking test comes in two categories. The first set of tests assess how well these headsets track individual fingers and hand gestures when obscured or partially obscured by other parts of the hand. Uh, this set also assesses how well they differentiate between hands when one is obscuring the other or when they're in very close proximity or even touching. The, these tests include thumbs up and down, closed fists, peace signs, finger guns, uh, placing the hand over the hand, and uh, prayer gesture, all under various orientations, of course. The second set involves tracking under different environments or when manipulating an object. Here I assess tracking while holding a uh, generic can from both the side and from the top, uh, which is obscuring significant parts of the hand, of course, and also while manipulating a small object, such as a 20-sided dice. In addition, I'm also testing the tracking capability when my hands are against various surfaces, a hard surface such as a wall, uh, a fully reflective surface, and a softer surface such as an office carpet, per se. Uh, for all these assessments, I categorize them into three broad categories. The first being that tracking is perfect and there are no problems at all. The second being that tracking sort of works to some extent, but has problems of varying, varying degrees of severity. And the last, of course, is being that tracking has completely failed entirely and just simply does not work. So let's get started with the successful tests first. These are the tests that neither the Oculus Quest nor the HoloLens 2 had really any problems tracking my hands or individual fingers. As an aside, I should mention that when recording these assessments with the HoloLens 2 specifically, the visual rep representation on my hands do not align well with my physical hands in the following videos, so it's going to look a little bit off. However, when wearing and looking through the headset, the holograms do line up just fine with my hands. So first on this list include the thumbs up and thumbs down hand gestures. Uh, and here, neither headset really had any issues tracking my thumbs or individual fingers, particularly when uh, those fingers are being obscured in some form by the rest of my hand. The next test include the palms up and palms down hand gestures. Uh, again, here there are no problems tracking my hand or individual fingers, which is not much of a surprise as there's very little orientation. I will note that when flexing the hands below a certain level uh, underneath the wrist tends to cause tracking to stop for both the HoloLens 2 and the Oculus Quest, but beyond that, uh, tracking is just fine uh, for this hand gesture. The next test includes the closed fist hand gesture. Uh, here again, and similar to the thumbs up and thumbs down hand gestures, there are no problems tracking my thumbs or individual fingers when they are being partially or entirely obscured by the rest of my hand. So both headsets are doing a pretty good job guessing the orientation of my fingers here. The next test in this list include hands being flat on a reflect reflective surface. Um, here, we don't see any problems with indiv individual fingers or thumbs being tracked while the hand are being placed flat against that reflective surface for both the HoloLens 2 and the Oculus Quest. So that is it for the fully successful test where neither headset had any problems tracking my hands or fingers. The Next series of tests fall into the less than successful category, where either the HoloLens or the Oculus Quest or both had some problems tracking my hands um, with these particular gestures. First on this list include manipulating a 20-sided dice. Um, here, neither headset really had any problems tracking uh, my fingers or my hands while I'm manipulating the dice. However, when moving the dice from one hand to the other, the Oculus Quest simply stops tracking fingers. Uh, so it has a problem being able to detect when those fingers are, or when the hands are in close proximity to each other uh, during the transition process. Uh, the HoloLens 2 doesn't seem to have a problem with that. The next test includes the peace sign. Um, here, the Oculus Quest 2 simply wins out and doesn't have any problems with tracking individual fingers uh, while they are even obscured. However, the HoloLens 2 is making a pretty poor guess uh, to the orientation of my ring and my index fingers for both hands uh, when they are obscured from uh, by the rest of my hand. The 
Next test includes hands being flat on the wall. Um, here, the Oculus Quest doesn't really have any problems um, tracking my hands or fingers in this case, whereas the HoloLens 2 is having some difficulty distinguishing my hands from the wall, particularly with my left hand when tracking tends to flake out every now and then. Next tests in this line include the Spock sign or the live long and prosper hand gesture. Um, here the Oculus Quest is able to track the separation between my index and ring finger when performing that gesture, but the HoloLens 2 is unable to detect that change. Uh, it instead assumes that my fingers are being equally spread apart when performing that gesture. Next tests on this list include finger guns. Um, here again, the Oculus Quest really doesn't have any problems tracking my uh, hands, thumbs, or fingers in any orientation, whereas the HoloLens 2 is really struggling to figure out the orientation of my fingers. Uh, the HoloLens is assuming that my index fingers are being bent along with my uh, rest of my fingers. So the HoloLens 2 is kind of making an assumption on the limitations of my fingers um, based on the orientation, the positions of my thumb and index finger. And it's kind of guessing incorrectly here. Next up is the hands in prayer gesture. Um, as mentioned before, the Oculus Quest tends to have a lot of problems when, um, when your hands are in close proximity to each other. So here again, we see that the Oculus Quest simply stops tracking entirely. Uh, whereas the HoloLens 2 is still tracking, but is having a hard time distinguishing between hands and fingers um, in this particular case. In fact, you'll, you'll notice that my, uh, the fingers on my left hand tend to curl in uh, or lose tracking entirely um, when I'm shifting my hands over and over, over each other. The next test includes holding a can from the side. And here we see that the HoloLens 2 is struggling pretty hard guessing the orientation of my fingers, particularly when my index finger is being obscured by the can. Uh, however, the thumb is being tracked pretty well. Whereas in the Oculus Quest, um, tracking is kind of on the same level as the HoloLens 2. It's, there's a lot of guesstimation happening. There's a lot of warping happening between individual fingers. Um, and also that it's unable to see that my, uh, or guess that the rest of my fingers um, are in the same orientation as my index finger when my index finger is not obscured uh, in the same manner as the rest of my fingers while holding the can. And subsequently from that, holding a can from the top also tends to have its own problems. Uh, the HoloLens 2 is having less of a harder time uh, tracking individual fingers while holding a can from the top and is able to get a better understanding or guess, you should say, of my fingers uh, under certain orientations. Whereas the Oculus Quest, again, is struggling very hard when my hands get close to each other uh, and is assuming that certain fingers are bent when they're actually not. And the final test in this assessment include the hands over hands gesture. And here we see that the HoloLens 2 is doing a pretty good job tracking the top hand as it crosses over the lower hand, while the lower hand is simply not being tracked. But also when the upper hand has fully crossed over the lower hand, the HoloLens 2 is making some really strange assumptions as to the orientation of both hands by placing the AR rep representations of those hands into the same space. Uh, for the Oculus Quest, tracking kind of simply stops. Uh, again, the Quest is having a very hard time distinguishing between hands when they are in close proximity to each other, and so tracking just simply stops in this case. So that's it for the hand tracking assessments with both headsets. Uh, overall, both do a decent job tracking hands and individual fingers. Uh, generally speaking, the Oculus Quest tracking capability works very well when hands are separated from each other and it's able to see your thumb and index finger. When it fails, however, it fails completely and tracking stops entirely. This happens when both hands are in very close proximity to each other or even uh, when individual fingers from one hand are obscuring those of the other hand. 
the HoloLens 2 doesn't do as great of a job as checking in individual fingers compared to the Quest, um, particularly with the Spock hand sign and the finger guns hand gesture, nor when hands are flat against a hard surface or a soft surface uh, due to the LiDAR sensor having problems di differentiating objects in contact with each other but also doesn't fail as badly as the Oculus Quest when hands are touching or obscuring each other, as seen with the hand over hand gesture and the prayer gestures. So I hope with this assessment, you have a better idea of how well these headsets work with tracking your hands and give you an idea of the limitations you'll encounter when including hand tracking into your XR applications. And with that, thank you for your time. Great, thank you, James. Mm -hmm. right, we are starting to see some questions in the Q&A window already. Yep, uh, hopefully you guys can hear me okay. You're a little quiet, actually. All right, uh, I'll try to speak a little bit louder. Um, yeah, so the first question, can you use the MPL to compare identical hand movements and can you make objective me measurements of differences? So I'm not entirely sure what MPL stands for. Um, I'm going to guess that that question is asking, can you use machine learning to compare identical hand movements? I hope that's correct. Um, if that is the case, then absolutely you can. Um, the Oculus Quest and the Quest 2 headsets are actually using machine learning to, to track the hands for one case. And um, I believe that they also provide an SDK with some of the machine learning capabilities built in um, in order to identify uh, like finger taps, for example. Uh, one of the one of the initial videos has a um... uh -oh. of this presentation has a video of two self. Um, oh, uh, as for. As for the next part of that question, can you make objective measurements James, of different- James, before you go far, you froze on the last one, uh, but there was a clarification. MPL stands for modular prosthetic limb. Oh, modular Whatever you said during your froze, you'll have to repeat. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my internet is not quite stable at this point in time. Um, modular prosthetic limbs, okay. So, um, yes, you can. <laughs> you can absolutely use, uh, use this to um, to compare identical hand movements with that. Uh, of course, you'd have to implement the software and whatnot to get the cape going, but um, that is absolutely possible. Um, and with that mindset, can you make objective measurements of differences? Um, certainly you can, but there would be a lot of uh, work necessary in order to minimize the, the error and the drift of error, because um, as you saw, some of the um, some of the visual overlapping of the physical hands versus the VR AI representation of those hands don't, aren't really one-to-one. -one. Um, the, the hand size in the Oculus Quest, for example, is the same regardless of your actual hand size itself. So you'd have to be careful of those kinds of differences. Um, okay, hopefully I don't freeze again. But the next question was, um, do you intend to continue these tests uh, using these test subjects other than myself, for example, assessing tracking performance on hands of different skin colors would be useful. Absolutely. So this is not a end all be all assessment. And as the technology, uh, hardware and software improves on this, um, we are going to be reassessing all of these capabilities one more time and adding more different, uh, adding more and different hand gestures and situations and light conditions, you know, whatnot um, to, to go under these tests. Because this is just an initial assessment of these two pieces of hardware. So as, again, more hardware comes about, we will be reassessing as we go along. Uh, let's see. What else? Were there any tests done in variable ambient light? Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, as I just said, you know, we're going to be reassessing this as we go along. Um, and we wanted to, at least for this initial assessment, I wanted to make sure that I have conditions as similar as possible. Um, so when I was performing these tests, I want to make sure that I'm in the same space and the same location with the same lighting. Um, let's see. Any thoughts on how you can combine hand tracking for user interface interaction with locomotion? Oh, um, so certainly using hand tracking for user interface is kind of a natural progression for even using hand tracking because then you'd use your hands to interact with whatever you're seeing or using, of course. Um, with locomotion, so 
that is kind of in play with certain applications that are on the market now. Um, one application I'm thinking of is called Spatial, uh, which you might have heard if you go to spatial.io, you'll see a demo application of this. Um, but that supports the HoloLens 2, the Oculus Quest, and Oculus Quest 2. Um, and they support hand tracking capabilities naturally. So that's actually turned on for the HoloLens 2 in particular. And in that way, um, uh, there's a option to, or a, a mechanism, I should say, to browse rooms and browse 3D content by having a panel pop up in front of you and swiping your hand left or right in this sort of left or right gesture. Uh, in order to dictate to the application that you want to scroll left or right. So absolutely that's in the place, uh, that's in place. Um, would wearing gloves, would wearing gloves that have a grid make any kind of difference? Um, I'm going to assume that by grid you mean some sort of texture differences based on the skin. Um, I imagine it will. Uh, again, this is something that we need to be testing in the future. Uh, and we will test in the future. Um, as for the grid itself, it's going to be interesting, actually, you mentioned this, because um, the the grid layout or the grid texture of the glove can change the lighting dynamics that's picked up on either sensor. So we could see some serious differences depending on if it's a Quest or if it's a HoloLens in that case. Uh, let's see. That's a lot of questions. Um, the Oculus Quest gesture recognition completely stops when the hands are close to each other. I would not be surprised if this were by design. They know the limitations of hand tracking in the scenario and simply opt to turn it off as opposed to showing the user hands fingers when that are being pulling tracked. What are your thoughts? Yes, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, because being like tracking your hand individually is one task that is beyond me. And I imagine they spent a lot of time working on this now. And that's, that's a complex problem in itself. But now when you have two hands and they're slightly or completely obscuring each other, that raises a whole new dimension of complexity that needs to be handled. And it, it, in my mind, it becomes a question of, do we need to get this thing to work and work now and get it out to the audience? Or can we spend more time in-house and in developing this sort of capability and spending perhaps an even exponentially longer time developing this to handle the situations? Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing too is, again, absolutely shut it off um, because if you don't shut it off, you might end up in situations with HoloLens 2 where I have you know, two hands across from each other like this and you see both hands overlaid in one direction. Um, if you're developing an application for, uh, for, for hand, that uses hand tracking in this manner uh, and you don't account for those situations, then you will end up with um, some fairly serious problems of controlling whatever you're trying to control in this XR environment. So simply having and does this work versus and does this not work versus well it kind of works and it kind of doesn't work is probably a better approach to have uh, to set up just saying you know if it works great we understand it works we're confident that it works versus we, we're confident it does not work or having a well we need to work around this problem because it may or may not work um it's basically like how you flavor programming um where is he tested with the quest one or two right so this was tested using the oculus quest one um, and while we do need to perform an assessment for the Quest 2, I will say that it is using the same software, the same hand tracking software as with the Quest 1. So um, from what I've seen so far, there's virtually zero difference uh, between the two headsets for the hand tracking capabilities. But that is something that we do need to ensure and assess. Uh, given your results, would you, would you prefer the Oculus, would you prefer Oculus or HoloLens 2? Oh, that's a can of worms. Um, it's going to depend on the application, okay? Um, the Oculus is a, well, okay, if I'm, if I'm going to work on a VR specific application, then I definitely have to use the Oculus, uh, simply because the HoloLens 2 is not VR. Uh, if, the HoloLens, if I'm going to work on an AR application, then I would use the uh, HoloLens 2 in this case. Um, if, if, let's say that, it doesn't matter. Let's let's assume that in this case, both the Oculus and the Colons 2 are kind of in the same XR space, you know, say stick with virtual reality or some such. Then in that case, I would I would want to use the HoloLens hand tracking capability. I'm sorry, let me rephrase. I want to use the Oculus hand tracking capability over the HoloLens 2 um, because of the, for one, the pass fail mechanisms where either it works well or it does not work at all. Um, and two, uh, because the tracking ability is, is a bit more robust, to be perfectly honest, in my opinion. Uh, hopefully that question is answered well. 
Um, next question with the HoloLens 2, I've noticed that hand tracking tends to stop working when my arms are fully extended. Have you noticed any difference in tracking volume? Um, have you done any tests with other people's hands coming to the tracking space? Also, have you done any comparisons to different lighting conditions? Right. So um, I have noticed on uh, fairly rare occasions that if I extend my hand out as far as possible, the tracking tends to get a little bit flaky, um, but not enough for it to be a noticeable problem for the applications I'm developing. Um, oftentimes, oftentimes my, um, it's rare for me to be reaching out too far when using the HoloLens. Um, and so when I'm performing hand gestures, it's usually at, I usually have my hands at sort of a desktop level position. Um, so I've never really encountered a whole lot of that, but that is something that, um, that should be looked at in further depth. Um, let's see, have you noticed any differences in tracking volume? I assume that's going to be the same, send the same questions. And I just lost, uh, let's see here. There we go. Um, and again, with with tests with near people's hands, coming the tracking space, that's that's another assessment that we need to follow. So no, I have not done that, and that is something we do need to test. Um, and have you done any comparisons to different lighting conditions? Again, uh, no for this particular test, and something we will assess in the in future assessments. Um, I think there's one more question. Ah, is the new Oculus Quest two any different from hand tracking than the Quest one? Uh, not that I have seen. Um, uh, so I have both. Uh, I've played with both headsets. I currently have the Oculus 2, Oculus Quest 2 on my on hand right now. Um, I have not seen any difference at all with the capabilities or um, really the the ability to hand track um, between the two headsets. So to me, they're virtually the same. All right. Do we have any more questions from the attendees? Checking the chat. Oh, looks good. All right. Thank you very much, James. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank all of our speakers today and uh, remind everyone that we will be picking up tomorrow again at 11 a.m. Uh, I want to remind you that it is a different Zoom link tomorrow, a different one each day, and you already have each day's link in the initial email that you received. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow at 11 o'clock Eastern. <laughs>